And finally, Assembly Member um, Hall, for whom Assembly Member Prince is substituting today. Thank you. Welcome all. Declaration of interest. As ever, can I ask the committee to note the recommendation item two. And again, as usual, I ask members to declare any other disclosable pecuniary interests and other relevant interests that are not detailed therein. Item three. Can ask the committee to confirm the minutes of the meeting on the 17th of October to be signed as a correct record. Thank you. Item four. Can ask the committee to note the completed and ongoing actions arising from previous meetings as listed in the report. Item five, uh, can ask the committee to note the recent action taken by me under delegated authority following consultation, namely to agree a letter to the Deputy Mayor for Policing and Crime regarding the upcoming Violence Against Women and Girls Strategy Refresh. And can we note the letter? Thank you. Right, we move now to the substantive part of the morning. And again, I welcome both Sophie and Martin to the meeting. Pleased to see you, Martin, deputising for the deputy. Um, first of all, though, I'd like, before we launch into the, into the questions, I'd like to ask you to comment on the report uh, by the HMIC FRS, which was published, I think, uh, last week, which was the assessment across all of the forces um, around um, efficiency. Um, and the findings of the report um, are disappointing. They will disappoint you, no doubt. Uh, particularly about the grading on requiring improvement across the piece, particularly around how well does the force understand demand and how well does the force use its resources. Now, we will return this as a substantive question in December to explore it more fully, uh, because you'll probably need a bit more time to, to, re to react to it. But initially, I, I'd like your thoughts around it. And, and one, I'm picking up perhaps particularly on one point, which was the disappointment around the uh, non-emergency 101 responses. I'd, I'd ask you both to, to comment um, on the report, if you would. Sure. Um, so if I go, for, I mean, obviously it is, um, it's very disappointing to us to get um, a requires improvement grading. Um, I think all inspections, you've got to look at them in, in the context. Um, it is a, it's a two week snapshot in time. Um, and we've obviously had quite a bit of discussion subsequent to the initial um, when they first gave us the report prior to it actually being, um, being published. As you point out, a real focus in that report on um, the communication centre and particularly non-emergency. I think we've spoken in here before about some of the challenges that we, we face within, the, within the, the communications command and there's quite a significant programme to increase the number of people um, working in that environment because we've got vacancies at the moment which has had, a, has had an impact on the 101 and I think there have been some improvements around the 101. October was not great but there have been improvements around that and obviously there's been an enormous focus on us around the, um, the emergency calls as well and, and improving where performance has been around that which we've achieved. So it is disappointing. We recognise the issues within the communication centre and we are we have a plan in terms of how we are going to get the staffing up and some of the other processes there i think it could have also perhaps more recognized all the other work that we're doing around the way in which people can contact us and the work we're particularly doing around the around the online <coughs> offer that we have to people so there is a broader range which i think uh, we would say is is all assisting um, generally in in terms of how people are able to link with us. One of the other key issues that was, was raised in the port was the, was the issue around a kind of comprehensive skills audit within the organisation. And we did push back on that because that had been a previous um, recommendation. And, and whilst you can understand that maybe in other forces in another context, that's a beneficial thing to have, we, we do still hold the position that in an organisation on the size of ours, the effort required to go through an individual skills audit for every person who works for us is not justified by the benefit that we think would come from that. We have a whole range of different systems by which we understand, particularly those people who are working in the specialist worlds, but we understand the skill sets available. We have registers around a whole range of things, people with language skills. There's, there's, there's numerous ways that we understand the skills of our staff, but the HMI felt that that ought to be brought into a comprehensive um, list, which, which we, we don't agree with that. 
And then I would also point out that in terms of future planning, we did receive, they graded that as good, which I think is really important. Because in terms of efficiency overall, we have taken £600 million out of our budget. We've dealt with all the things that we've sat here and spoken about as well over that period. And we are now in a process of planning how we take out another £400 million. So it is a disappointing grade. We're looking at all the aspects that, that went into that grade. And as I say, we've had a, a strong debate with HMIC um, in relation to that. And we will continue to try and, and improve those issues that have, have been deemed not to be good enough. Okay. So we'll be returning to this in more depth, um, yep. probably with the depth in, yes. in December. Now, Sophie, what, what do you, what's your response to the report and your thoughts around it? So I would echo what you've said as Chair and also what Martin has said, that it is a disappointing report. Um, it's disappointing that, um, it, you know, it, to get a grade requiring, requiring improvement is disappointing. In terms of what it's focused on and what it's highlighted in terms of the issues, I think, um, I think it'd be fair to say none of those were surprising. And what would be very worrying is if, we, if myself and the Met weren't aware of issues like 101 and um, in terms of some of the issues around the command and control centres. So my view of it is absolutely disappointing, but there are significant programmes of work and plans underway addressing most of the um, recommendations in the report that have been highlighted. We do need to discuss around skills audit and what the benefits or um, disbenefits are of that. Um, but the Met does have the ability to know what the skills are in terms of language, as Martin has pointed out. But I would also um, do take a little bit of uh, positivity around the fact that the HMIC does rate as good plans for the future. And in terms of really meeting demand and making sure there's absolutely efficient use of resources, that is around the transformation in the Met. And there is, there is a massive amount of effort, very, very solid plans, as reflected by the HMIC report, for that in the future. Transformation is underway. It's by no means complete, but this report does, uh, does give a little bit of confidence around that. But in terms, as I've said, it is disappointing in terms of the report. It has to be set in context that the Met, and it was a snapshot of two weeks, but the Met in the last year has un been under enormous pressure for terrorist attacks, rising in crime, and then you cannot... You cannot disaggregate the absolute pressure that the financial situation is putting on the Met, but it, clearly we do need to make sure that we get the 101 response, command and control response, absolutely right. And I know that that has been taken extremely seriously within the Metropolitan Police. I mean, the, the 101 particularly, I mean, yeah. this committee knows full well from mm -hmm. its constituents and others yeah. that the, 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 the failings of, the, of, of that where people are just giving up. And the mm -hmm. report points out that they may be people that are in real need and are having to give up. So, you know, it is important that, that that's attended to, and, and, and it's important that MOPAC, uh, in its role, holds the Met to account uh, to ensure that that's addressed. So we will return to this um, in December more fully, and we may hear more about the action plan at that time. So turning back to the questions, um, the first one, uh, which I shall lead on, is a year on from the Harris report, um, and it's been well documented and, and aired in this chamber um, about um, the length of time um, that the report took to be published and the time that the Mayor took to comment on it, but the, the report is welcome with the recommendations um, around it. Um, now, the Mayor's published um, an update on the Harris report, which, which we've, all, we've all seen. Uh, so, first of all, the question really to, to to Martin, is now that the Mayor has published an update um, on the report, is the Met in a better position to protect Londoners from terrorism <coughs> than it was indeed a year ago from the beginning of the um, Lord Harris's work? Well, <clears throat> I mean, I think there's, there's no question that there's been a huge amount of development in terms of how we prepare for and respond to terrorist incidents during that period clearly in response to um, Lord Harris's report, but obviously also in response to the fact that we've had a number of incidents during that period of time that have, that have taught us um, significant numbers of lessons and given us uh, new, new ways of operating. We, we had 54 recommendations in the report and 43 of those are now complete. Um, my colleague, uh, Pat Gallum, one of the other ACs, chairs a group that is driving forward the, the outstanding um, recommendations. We are, I think, in a place where our preparedness is as good as it has ever been, 
but that of course is balanced against the fact that we know that there is a significant threat um, as um, Mark Rowley and Neil Basu and others have said I think what we've seen is not a spike in the threat it is a it is a step change in in the threat that we face and um, that is coming from many different angles so the tempo of activity within counter-terrorism command and all those who are associated with CT is extremely high and has been high for the last 12 month period even excluding the incidents so I think we are in as good a place as we can be in terms of our preparedness but I do not underestimate the challenge that we face with the nature the scale and the and the diverse nature of the of the threat that we're we're dealing with at the moment your point was that um, many of or two-thirds of the recommendations have been enacted by yourselves yep. and others but one of the critiques of the report was of, of the report itself was that there were 125, 126. There were a lot of recommendations. I know the, mayor, the deputy will probably come in, in on this. What would concern Londoners out there who heard that would be we've implemented two thirds with Pat Gallen's uh, work, yeah. but there are others that haven't been. Now, we know around this chamber that some of those are very dependent on outside org organisations, but there are still that have not, some that have not been implemented, Martin. Do you want to give some assurance or thoughts around the ones that. You yeah, don't have to go through the whole list, but give no. us some reassurance around the ones that haven't been implemented, yeah. that are within your gift to implement? Yeah, I mean, I mean so we've, we've got uh, 11 ongoing, of, and it's sort of six rough sort of theme areas. And, and I would say that I think when you look at those theme areas, we can give some confidence that, that they are not so much lesser order, but they're either longer term or they're more peripheral, if you like, in terms of our capability. So there was one which is around um, the challenge that we've had in terms of um, firearms instructors because as you are all aware we have had a significant step up in the number of armed officers that have allowed us to respond the way we have um, responded over the summer period but a real challenge around that is getting the qualified instructors so there's a whole range of work going through there but I'm confident that we are up to speed in terms of where we are in the firearms officers there are some that are related to things that will happen in the future such as the um, replacement of the airwave system so our radio system and just making sure that we're doing everything we need to do and we are heavily engaged with that program but that hasn't come to fruition yet working with other agencies so working with the port london authority around what role they may have in terms of safety on the river we obviously have a significant ct presence on the river but we're also working with pla and and that work is that work is ongoing and equally working with um security industry authority so sia um, staff that are obviously present all over London and have a key role to play and I think that forms part of our larger bit of work that we're doing whether it's with schools whether it's the security industry businesses around everyone's preparedness to deal with incidents were they to um, were they to occur and then and then really the last one last grouping there is around sharing the best practice and the venue mapping process that the GLA has so I would describe the outstanding actions as as more peripheral the very key actions around operational capability and some of the planning work I think we've we've progressed very well with so I think we could reassure Londoners that we are in as good a place as we can be that work will continue but always against what is an increased and and I think more challenging level of threat thank you Mark. now turning to the deputy mayor sorry oh, Mesh, you want to come in go on you go can I yeah go on. Uh, you just said deputy uh, assistant commissioner uh, we can reassure Londoners that we are in as good a place as we can be. But here we have the Mayor of London in today's Guardian, and I quote, I'm increasingly worried about the ability to keep Londoners safe in the context of the cuts being made, not just to the counter-terror budget, but the overall policing budget. He goes on to make another point, but finishes up by saying, I'm seriously worried about our ability to keep our city safe. I'm always worried about our ability to keep our city safe. The fact is, we have a very sophisticated and well-developed counter-terrorism response. It is as good as it has been. I think we've responded effectively to the incidents that have occurred. But of course, I think what the, the, that interview is reflecting is reflecting the level of the threat and the diverse nature of the threat that exists 
and I think looking to the potential impact on us as we move forward in terms of resource levels. It's, yeah, to be fair, he makes a point in the context of cuts, um, yeah. not in terms of your, um, the work that you are doing. Um, and of course, one of Lord Harris's recommendations was about um, fully funding the, the NIC element of the NIC grant. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's in that context, to be fair. Um, yeah. And I accept that you know, any, any further cuts to our resource level will have an impact on all aspects of policing, inevitably. And therefore, we have got to plan for how we would deal with those, how we will deal with those cuts if those cuts come. But CT policing is obviously an absolute priority. And, and really, the point I was trying to make was, I think we are as prepared as we ever have been in terms of our capability and the work we do with other people. But that is against a, con a context of an increased and increasing and more diverse threat. And of course, which the article there plays in, any further cuts to our resources will inevitably have an impact. Yeah. I'll ask my further questions and I'll bring others in. Turning to um, the Deputy Mayor, we talked about working with Port of London Authority and other, other partners. One of the recommendations was um, merging the City of London Police. I believe that Lord Harris commented that uh, response may be improved if a single force covered the policing for London. Um, would you like to comment on the decision, the Mayor's decision, about not going forward with that option? Yes, of course. But can I just say before I do that in terms of reassuring, reassuring Londoners about uh, preparedness to, um, in the event of a terrorist attack, the original Harris report actually found that in terms of preparedness it was good the recommendations were ones to improve that it didn't find that there were there were holes in the, yeah. in the, in the preparedness so i think that should be reassuring to londoners and in the fact that so many of the recommendations are either in train or have been resolved should also be reassuring but it is the fact that it was always good operationally and take the point about absolutely going forward what does that mean in terms of budget cuts and resources available but operationally um, as uh, Martin has said, the Met is an extremely good position and probably a better posi position now, now that some of the recommendations really have been implemented. In terms of the City of London um, Police, I mean, the, um, the wording of the recommendation was around undertaking a full assessment of the benefits around the City of London Police in relation to some of the other, um, other reviews that were taking a place about the policing infrastructure, for example, around the MOD or the um, Civil and Nuclear Defence um, uh, Constabulary. What the, um, it, what lay behind that recommendation was about ensuring that there was interoperability and extremely good partnership working, and that has absolutely been the case, and that's been proven in terms of the terrorist attacks that have taken place, especially on Westminster Bridge and London Bridge. So in terms of you know, what, is, what is needed um, for the City of London Police, the Metropolitan Police and British Transport Police to be working together, that is there, and that is, um, we have confidence that that is there in terms of the partnership working. Martin, you'd, would you agree from an operational point of view that there would not be a significant improvement if the forces were merged? I think from an operational point of view in dealing with, with counter-terrorism, we work very, very closely. Uh, as, as Sophie says, you know, the London Bridge example was the, a very clear one where the ARV that arrived there first was a, a City of London ARV. So I think we work very closely. We train collectively. We work to the same processes. So that interoperability, I think, is very strong. And turning last, before I open it up, the two other recommendations. Um, one was about appointing a counter-terrorism advisor. Um, and again, this was something that the Mayor, on reflection, decided against. Would you like to comment on that as well? Yeah, I mean, that was one of the recommendations, and I think that recommendation, again, what lay behind it was to ensure that the City Hall and MOPAC had the, um, the correct level of uh, capacity and expertise around counter-terrorism. Given the four terrorist attacks that we have um, encountered in London, we have found that actually in terms of response, advice and ability to brief and, and you know, looking forward around counter-terrorism, that actually the capacity and the capability is extremely strong. We will continue to keep that under review as to whether we need any extra resources, but it, as it stands at the moment, we have found through practice and through, in, through the terrorist attacks that that is strong and it's, uh, we have decided we don't at this stage need a counter-terrorism advisor. That leads to that third point, which is about MOPAC capacity. You are there to oversee the safety of Londoners. 
through um, operations of, of the Met and to have that capacity and expertise to be able to scrutinise and hold to account quite properly the, the Met. So, so one of the points was around the capacity of MOPAC to fulfil its function in these difficult times, and, and you are uh, reassured that MOPAC has that capacity. Given what we've been through in the last few months around the four terrorist attacks, I'm reassured not just that MOPAC has that capacity, but City Hall has that capacity. We have extremely strong relationships between the Metropolitan Police and also Mark Rowley, who takes the lead on counter-terrorism, and I am reassured at this stage, yes. Okay. We, uh, I think a meeting in January where yeah, MOPAC is coming that. here, we're mm -hmm. going to be talking to senior people around that. So, so first of all, Leonie, I saw, I think you signalled. Thank you. I, I sort of want to go back to um, the area that... Um, Unmesh was just talking about, um, and whilst I think saying that we're prepared is one thing, um, I actually think the context has changed quite a lot since last year. Um, you, you know, we have to, and it's not just uh, Westminster Bridge and London Bridge, it's also the Finsbury Park Mosque and also the Parsons Green Tube, which is absolutely full of my constituents, and I'm just very glad that that viable device was, <coughs> in the end, did not go off, because it would have been horrific. But you're also operating within the context of a frozen NHS budget and, in a lot of cases, police officers being expected to deal with people with florid mental health problems on the street. We've got before us, and we're going to talk about the increase in both knife crime and moped crime, um, and acid attacks have also been hitting the news. So the, I think the context is different. So being prepared is one thing, but I'm also thinking about the resilience of the officers who are there and I don't, I, police officers will always step up. There's no doubt about that. But have we really got the capacity for that stepping up to deal with these big incidents to take place and for people then to take back the additional hours that they've spent on doing these things? Because I'm concerned from talking to people across the Met that you know we are actually at a point of significant stretch. So I think, yes, we're prepared. Yes, yes officers will step up. But at what price is that going to happen? Um, I don't think there is any question that we are under unprecedented pressure at the moment. Um, there, are, there are rises in crime, which, are, which I have to say are, are national rises in crime and in, in all other parts of the country are higher. But there is the rise in crime. There is the issues that we're going to talk about later around all the violent crime, which are really very concerning. Um, and you've got this step up in terms of terrorist activity and the diverse nature of the terrorist activity. Each one of those incidents requires an enormous response. And again, and, and last time I sat here, you know, made the point that that response is not purely from those people that are badged as counter-terrorism officers, it's the organisation in the round. And there is, there is huge pressure in the organisation at the moment. We, as you would imagine, um, are extremely concerned about the kind of, I think what you were describing there were the welfare concerns around, yeah. around officers in terms of not only the kind of incidents they're having to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, let alone the big, this high-scale events, but also in that, what's the, the impact of that in terms of missed rest days, missed time off, and all the rest of those things that we all understand. So you're right, our people will step up, and every single time our people step up, and there's other events that we, you know, we could talk about Grenfell and the impact of that and the, the resource impact. So we are under as much pressure as I can remember us being under, which is partly why we're doing all the planning we're doing as to how we, how we deliver a service, how we reorganise ourselves to deliver that as efficiently and as effectively as we can. But it's, it's, um, it is a very, very challenging period that we're in at the moment. I mean, for me, and I don't know whether the Deputy Mayor um, would like to answer on this, but, you know, the sooner we get <coughs> uh, the full amount for the National and International City Grant um, to help us with these very prominent targets, as well as all of the background increase in all of these other areas, I mean, surely that's extremely important for us in London. Absolutely, it is important, and it was one of the key recommendations within the report around, and it is not a recommendation that has been, you know, in terms of the, the, what, are, what are the recommendations that haven't been resolved, that is one of the key recommendations that hasn't been. We are significantly shortchanged in London on that. That is around the capital city, and, we, and as you know, we are lobbying very hard because 
as Neil Basu has said recently, as well as Mark Rowley, this isn't just about the counter-terrorism money or the capital city money. It is also because policing, and it is that going back to policing is a system. It is the communities that will be our best, you know, are our best um, eyes and ears and um, ability to give information to the police that they need to really counter terrorism. And if that is under significant, not just under significant pressure, we are, you know, having to look at a fall in officer numbers. If that continues, we are going to be, uh, we are under pressure. As the mayor has said, we are extremely concerned about keeping the safety of Londoners. Thank you. Thank you. There, there's no dispute that um, the fairness of the NIC funding is something that concerns all of us around, around this horseshoe. So, Caroline, you wanted to. I just wanted to pick up something the chair was asking about in terms of capacity at MOPAC. Who at MOPAC is leading on the counter terrorism work and linking in with the Met? There are a number of officers that lead on, you know, have the um, have within their remit leading on uh, counter-terrorism and linking in with the Met. I regularly meet with Mark Rowley as well, as well as the Mayor, and we have that ability to. And it's not just MOPAC that has the ability to look at what is happening across the range of counter-terrorism resilience around preparedness. Fiona Tricross <coughs> leads for the, the Fire Brigade yeah. and chairs the Resilience Forum as well, and has officers underneath that do that work as well. So, which officers? How, you said you. Well, few. it's the. I mean, in terms of leading, um, the chief executive will lead on the counter-terrorism, as will the directors because it cross cuts across a number of different areas. The chief executive and all the directors have a lead around counter-terrorism. They are working on counter-terrorism, yes. We have that. OK, I think we might want to pick that up, flesh that out in January then. Thank you. Right. OK. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. We obviously would return to this in January, particularly around resources and MOPEC, uh, but obviously it's a debate that we will continue uh, looking at around the funding <coughs> and terrorism itself. Now, the next um, set of questions is around... Uh, Brexit, EU exit security and law enforcement. It's talking about the existing partnership arrangements with the EU that are under uh, review, um, shall we say. Um, and we've got some questions around that, which I think, Tony, do you want to lead on? Yes, uh, I'd like to ask <coughs> uh, Mr Hewitt some questions on this, please. Supposing, Mr Hewitt, you had a request from your opposite number in Oslo uh, to... Um, help with um, <laughs> a crime which had uh, Norwegian connections, um, would you uh, give them all possible help? We give them all possible Would you give your colleague from Norway, who's mm. asking for your help in mm. respect of some uh, uh, criminal offence which has some sort of British connection? Uh, with the offence, mm. would you give them all possible help? Well, I'm sure that we would um, endeavour to do that um, within whatever legal frameworks existed for us to, to work with them, because we obviously work with law enforcement agencies in numerous countries, and you work through mutual legal assistance processes. So, of course, we would, we would try to give it all the help that we could do if they, if they requested it. And and supposing this, uh, the situation was reversed and you wanted their help mm -hmm. for something which had happened mm -hmm. here, where they could help you, would mm -hmm. you expect them to give you all possible help? Well, I would expect the same process to work. And as I say, as long as there is a, a legal framework for whatever, whatever the help looks like, then we would work through that to try and assist. What, what might be the legal difficulties? Let's, let's say um, it's, I don't know, a murder suspect. Mm. What, what um, legal thing would prevent you from assisting them? Well, it's not so much as preventing, but it depends what activity you are being asked to do. So whether you will get into issues around potentially sharing information, sharing intelligence, mm -hmm. or actually undertaking police activity. But we work through mutual legal assistance processes to agree whether... So you would be looking to... This is obviously an offence. It's an offence in their country, what the legal status of that would be in this country, and then we would seek to assist, because that's a, a relatively routine occurrence. So, so it's re relatively routine. And, and I, I, I'm talking about something which is clearly an offence. A serious offence, yeah, of course. You know. um, similarly, if uh, one of your uh, uh, counterparts in Paris mm. is asking for your help, um, would the help you give your uh, 
Parisian counterpart be in any way different from the help that you will give to the man in Oslo? Well, it rather depends on what they were asking for, but the fact of the matter is, as long as there, whatever the legal framework is that exists to allow us to do what we do, and we have a lot, we will constantly be working in what we would call police to police cooperation with other countries and other police forces or police services. Mm -hmm. But that's what we would, so it would depend on what the request was and what the appropriate legal framework was for us to, to operate within. Well, let, well, well let's take a, a, a sort of case which we can, we can, we can all understand. Mm -hmm. Somebody who uh, uh, is uh, believed to have uh, committed a murder, uh, shall we say, for whom a warrant has been issued either by the Norwegians and they think he's come here, or one where... Uh, we believe such a person um, uh, has, has, gone, has gone to Norway. Under those circumstances, is, is there anything which will prevent you from giving them assistance? In, uh, and more importantly, is there likely to be any difference in the quality of the assistance you give to the man in Norway to the man that you will give in France? No, there's no qualitative difference. The only, the defining factor is whether a legal framework exists for us to do whatever it is the other country is asking us to do, yes. if that exists, and we have, we have a, a, a team within, within the Met that would deal with any request coming from anywhere else, and we would then, to the, to the powers that that authority gives us, we would support that other police force. We wouldn't decide one was more important than the other. It would simply be what the power exists and obviously the nature of the crime itself. Yes. So, under, uh, under, un, under those circumstances, it doesn't really matter, does it, whether um, a crime has been uh, committed by a member of the Europe, uh, the assistance is being given to a fellow member of the European Union, or anybody else, does it? it do, in what sense it doesn't matter? Well, what, I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, you get a request for assistance from another, from another country, whether or not it is a member of the European Union or not, the assistance you will give and the assistance you would expect will be the same. Provided and based upon the provisions, the legal provisions that are there to allow us to do whatever we do. And where I think if we are trying to do a contrast between a European member state and one that isn't a European member state, I suppose the comment would I, make, it would, I would make that within the provisions within the European member states, there are additional legal frameworks and additional mechanisms by which we can both assist but also share information, share intelligence and share understanding. So there is a differential there, but if someone is coming with a murder case, yes. in the example you're giving, yes. then provided the legal framework exists, then I think we would always seek to support that, that police force. Yes. So um, membership of the European Union or indeed any other agreement in, in the case of pursuing a criminal um, is not really relevant in terms of a mutual <coughs> assistance which will be given? Well, it's relevant in the sense that it provides a greater degree of capability because there are statutory pathways through which we can assist, we can share intelligence and so on. Okay. So does the existence of these statutory pathways make um, uh, a, a situation in seeking to um, uh, deal with crime does that, could that possibly make the situation uh, less safe because there are different kinds of agreements? The Mayor, you know, has said that um, were we to uh, leave the European Union without any agreement on law and order matters, uh, London would be less safe. Can you, th can, can you think of anything um, which exists in the kind of legal framework which I think you're referring to, which would make um, London less safe? Well, our responsibility is to, is to keep London safe and to deal with criminality in all its forms. Yes. What I would say about London is, as a, or if not the global city, and you will probably be familiar, we arrest 30% of the people we arrest in any given year are foreign nationals in this city, and probably half of those are European Union nationals. So that creates a context in terms of those, those cross-border issues. We would all accept that serious and organised crime is multinational, or it's international, and a place like London is quite clearly 
um, a prized place in terms of serious and organised criminality because of the wealth and, the, and everything that is in this city. And of course, we've already alluded to the CT threat. In that instance, from a police officer's perspective, I want all the powers available to me to not only investigate post an incident or an offence, but also to proactively prevent criminality. And I would say that we are in the position, which is the position <coughs> held by the National Police Chiefs Council, which is leading on this issue, that what we would want through the process that's going on at the moment is at least the same powers that we have now, if not greater powers, to allow us to best keep this city safe. Let me try and phrase the question another way. Is it more difficult for you to apprehend uh, someone who is neither a citizen of the United Kingdom nor a citizen of the EU, someone who you know to be a criminal, for, who, in the example I've given, a murderer who's here yeah. in your jurisdiction is somewhere in London, you know where he is. Uh, is it going to be more difficult for you to arrest that person than if he were a member of the European Union? It's not, not necessarily, if, if we need to arrest someone, we need to arrest someone. The point, I think, is not simply about someone who needs to be arrested. And even if you do arrest a person, so, for example, the European arrest warrant facilitates a much smoother process of that sort of, that sort of situation being done between member state countries. If you are with a non-member state country, you are into other kind of extradition type situations which are more complex and longer to deal with. But I also go back to the point about protecting and preventing crime, which is often based on our ability to know information and intelligence about individuals, to know information about individuals' previous criminal history, to be able to share quickly forensic or other identification methods. And all of those, in the case of where we are currently with the European Union, are facilitated and are processes that are there and exist, and they are beneficial processes to us in preventing and then dealing with crime when it happens. In the example that, in the example that I have given, the, you would arrest such a person in the legal, if you like, niceties of how you then uh, deal with him, you will be dealing with, presumably, whilst that person is in custody or on bail, wouldn't you? So, uh, coming back to the original point about keeping London safe and actually um, banging up or having under your control the um, uh, offender, it makes no difference whether he's a European citizen or not, does it? It really would, de it really would depend on circumstances. The simple fact of the matter, if we're dealing with an offence that's taken place overseas or we're dealing with some individuals from overseas, there will always be a legal framework within which we have to operate, and that's quite proper. The legal framework that exists under the EU uh, situation as it is now, we believe, from a policing perspective, yes. is advantageous to us both preventing and investigating crime. And the position that I would take, which is the position that is taken by the National Police Chiefs Council, is that we would want those to remain or better provisions to allow us to best protect this city or policing in the UK. Yes. To your knowledge, has there ever been any circumstance, certainly in relation to Western Europe, has there ever been any difficulty in there being uh, you obtaining uh, cooperation from um, the uh, administration of civil law and order uh, between them and um, the United Kingdom? Has there ever been any difficulty, as far as you know, in pursuing a criminal? Well, I clearly don't have knowledge of all the times that we do those, yes. those kind of issues. I think the point I would make is, surely it is advantageous to us to make these processes as simple as we can make those processes to allow us to better protect people. Yes. And it isn't always around a post and offence investigation the area that particularly concerns me is about us being able to prevent okay. criminality. All of that sounds like process. Really, really the, simple question, the, 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 the simple question is, do you, do you believe that London will be less safe if um, there was no agreement, as the Mayor has said, uh, when this country leaves the European Union? I believe that to effectively police a global city, we need 
the provisions that are there to remain or to improve, but certainly to remain, to allow us to carry on protecting the city in the international context in which we do. I think we pursued that point. Oh, well, no, 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 I don't think we have. I don't think we have, Mr. Chairman. This, uh, this, 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 this is absolute. This is absolutely central to the line the which the mayor questions. and MOPAC are taking on um, uh, law and order and security of Londoners. Should we leave the European Union? And I'm seeking to get from. Uh, someone who, um, I agree uh, with you. who actually has to implement the laws as to whether or not London will be less safe. Um, and in okay, effect, okay. and do correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mr Hewitt, I don't really wish to mis 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 misinterpret you. In effect, you are saying uh, that uh, you don't want the existing rules to be altered because you believe them to be helpful to you. Is that right? I think they are essential in us doing the role that we need to do in, a, in an international yes. city with all the yes. threats that we face. Yes. Yes. Can I just say... I'm going to ask no, you, I'm going to ask you, Deputy no, Mayor, think, some can questions. I just ask, can I just interject? Because I think it is very important that it's not just the Assistant Commissioner Hewitt sitting here who is talking about what is needed post-Brexit. It is also the National Police Chiefs Council, the National Criminal yes, Justice yes, Agency, yes, yes. but also the Home Secretary who has said it yes. would be unthinkable to leave yes, Europe yes, without, yes. The, you know, without yes. a deal yes. and without looking yes. at these security measures. These are very, very serious senior people who are saying that, at, that what we have at the moment works and we need to have yes. something like that, if not better, after we leave the yeah, European Union. Deputy I, Mayor, I, I, Deputy, I'm going to add to this, if I may, I will come across both of you, and I'll bring you back in, Tony, if you need to, but it will be, would you not agree, it will be inconceivable, and I'm, I am a supporter of Brexit, and that's well documented, uh, across the range of Brexit, it will be inconceivable that on leaving uh, the European Union and leaving potentially the arrangements, it would be inconceivable that other arrangements would not be put into place and negotiated. And indeed, there will be scope indeed to improve upon the arrangements that we already have. I think would, that would, is would, you not, would you not agree that that, is, that, that will be and inconceivable? And that's absolutely the point that the Mayor, myself and the, uh, the leading police officers are saying, is that yes, it would be unthinkable. However, you know, we aren't that far, I mean, it feels a long way away. March 2019 is not that far away. There needs to be serious work undertaken to ensure that that does happen. At the moment, we have warm words of what, where we want to get to, but we don't have the how or the what or the detail of how we get there. That's what we're calling for. We need to know that if they're not going to get there, what the transitional arrangements are. If we don't have clear understanding of that sort of by the new year or the first quarter of the new year, we're going to start to be seriously concerned about what that means for individual police inquiries and individual police operations that have in the past, because of the, because of the structures that are in place through the European Union, have been used on a regular basis. 7,000 European um, <coughs> residents have been, have been, um, have been uh, returned to their home countries via the European arrest warrant. 1,000 Britons have been returned to Britain through the European arrest warrant. Yes, of course, it would be unthinkable if that weren't in place, but there has to be a serious amount of detailed work to ensure that is the case, because otherwise it really is a cliff edge and it won't be there. It's not whether you know, somebody like Assistant Commissioner Hewitt wants to participate or wants to help his fellow colleagues. Of course, that will be the case, but there has to be the legal framework there in place and ready to go. Okay. Well, well, I would like to ask you, 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 you Deputy Mayor. Question, you're, you're, well, no, it is, no, it, no, it's not the, it's not the, it's not on, the no, last question, go. Mr Chairman. The Mayor specifically has said, and I quote him, if we had no deal with the European Union, it would lead to those who visit our city, those who live in our city, being less safe. Now, that is a definitive statement. What I have been, what, 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 what I'm seeking for is, is the evidence. Why would they be less okay. safe? So if we do not have a proper and good deal in place in time for exiting Europe, which we do not have confidence at the moment, given, the, given all the, everything else that's going on, we will not have the EU passenger name records um, system whereby UK border agency can check passenger details of those that are on watch lists of who's coming in and out of country. We would not have that unless there is a deal. You are seriously saying, this is, a, this is akin to saying aircraft will fall out of the sky. 
Vehicles right. Information System, which enables, as Assistant Commissioner has been talking about, enables um, the police forces to assess risk, know what's happening, and get detailed information about people. These are incredibly important. Yes, we want that after the European uh, exit of Europe, of Europe, and the Home Secretary have said they, they want it, but the real crucial thing is how and when and what are they going to be doing to make sure that that happens. That's what the Mayor has been pressing, and that's what we're press we, I will continue to press about as well. Well, <coughs> well, some of us, well, me, would say that this is, that this is scaremongering. It is not dissimilar to those people who say that if there is no agreement, there is no agreement, no aircraft will fly. You know, it smacks very much, you know, of the millennium thing, you know, that the will come to a stop when, they, when, when, when the year ticks over. There is, there is no evidence. All, all, all that is being um, uh, said by you and, uh, uh, and, uh, and all of these other groups, I suspect is uh, uh, legal, legalistic and actually, <laughs> and actually, and actually nobody in the real world, just as with the analogy with the aircraft, believes that these things will not continue. And simply to say that things are going to be less safe, and I ask specifically why will be less safe, that's why, that's why I asked the question about a murderer. A murderer is not, that we know about is not <clears> going <throat> to be left roaming around London. A foreign murderer, is he? You've answered that already. So I'm, I'm now going to bring in Andrew. Thank you, Tony. Can I give you a specific example, Mr Hewitt? 147, we had to extradite from Italy one of these suspects, didn't we? How long did it take? I don't know the exact time period, but it was lengthy. I don't know is the answer. Well, I think it was a couple of weeks, actually. Um, uh, under the, the 2005 bombing. Yes. Through the oh, European sorry. arrest warrant, he was brought back within a couple of weeks and he was a suspect exactly. for the bombings. Absolutely. And if we didn't have the European arrest warrant yeah, and absolutely. had to extradite him from another country, supposing he'd gone to Turkey, for example, yeah. how long, yeah. well, we don't have European arrest warrant arrangements, no. how long would it take to bring him back, do you think? It would be considerably longer than two weeks. Yeah. So the European arrest warrant, as the Deputy Mayor said, is vital. Now, yeah. the, the Mayor set out six things that he thinks are red lines for security. And I'd like to ask whether you agree with those, uh, Mr. Hewitt. Um, Europol, yep. the European Arrest Warrant, the Schengen Information System 2, <coughs> uh, EU passenger name records, if heard from the Deputy Mayor, mm. European Criminal Records Information System, and the PRUM arrangements, which gives access to DNA profiles, fingerprint data, and vehicle registrations. Are all those important to fighting crime in London? They are all important, and that, I'd revert back to the point <coughs> I've made the whole process within UK law enforcement to respond to the current negotiations is being led jointly by the National Police Chiefs Council and the National Crime Agency. We are heavily involved with that process of work and our position is very clearly that what we would ask for and what we seek is at least the same provisions that we currently have, if not exactly. anything further. Right. So now, I think that answers that question. Yeah. Now, you were asked earlier on about arresting people in London. A lot of that depends on intelligence. And most of these things, apart from the arrest warrant itself, are to do with criminal intelligence, aren't they? Correct. So you may not even know who you have to arrest if you don't have access to that information or data. Is that right? It, it's the point I made around us also being able to prevent crime as well as respond to crime. There is clearly a significant advantage in us being able to okay. easily, legally, share intelligence and other information. Now, no deal means no deal on anything. Uh, it's been suggested that no deal doesn't actually mean no deal on anything. It means no deal on lots of things, but not on aircraft in the skies or... or, or, or that, that, you've had a good go. Or, or, no, or, or, on, or on security issues. But no deal, as far as the government is concerned and the EU is concerned, is no deal on anything. So the suggestion is we then have to box and cock somehow to make all these things happen. Now... Which, do we have these arrangements with any other countries, apart from <coughs> EU countries? Well, arranged, there are a number of bilateral arrangements, um, and in terms, you know, in terms of you know, the United States there are, there, and other yeah. countries, there are bilateral arrangements. But the whole point is that in order, what we have at the moment works 
It's very useful for individual the, the police forces across the country, not just the Metropolitan Police, to be able to ex, you know, get people back who are wanted, but also to share that information. The point is that we have to have that type of deal put in place for post, you know, for when we leave Europe. Otherwise, they do just fall. You can have a wish list of what you wish to do, but if it's not the legal framework, they do fall, and the police have to abide by the law and they can only do what they have got the legal framework so, to do. So there will either have to be lots of individual bilateral arrangements agreed and legally yeah. agreed or from so, our point of view we need this in terms okay. of absolutely so, having this in place. So Mr. if we look at Norway which was suggested earlier on, how many of these arrangements do we have with Norway? Well, I don't know that specific, I didn't mug up on Norway specifically <laughs> before coming to the uh, but the, oh dear, Martin. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. I apologise. Okay. Okay. Just, just, you know, I go back to the point. <laughs> that, and I, you know, and well, well, I, I, you let us know in due course. I, yeah, and I apologise for repeating it, but these are all capabilities, legal capabilities that allow us to better do the job that we need to do in protecting London and, for that matter, nationally. And yeah. that's so, therefore why our position is clearly that that's what we would want retained. Yeah. So if we take, for example, people trafficking. Uh, whether it be, mm. for example, that is a well-known international crime yep. where people are crossing borders. How easy would it be? For, it's difficult as it is to tackle, tackle people that traffic in, particularly those who are trafficked into the, into the sex industry, for whatever word, sex trade. How diffi more difficult it would it be if we didn't have access to all this information, <coughs> uh, sharing arrangements? Well, clearly that will be a more challenging investigative process. I think that's the point. We, you know, it's, it's probably no, there's no logic in me talking about what might be hypothetical processes or legal frameworks that may be put in place. The fact of the matter is, and that's a good example of a type of criminality where the arrangements that we currently operate under are incredibly helpful and beneficial to us in investigating that sort of criminality. And that's why we hold a position where we would want them retained. Well, I think earlier this year there was a major firearms seizure involving the Met, the National Crime Agency and others. Yep. Was that reliant on information that came under these arrangements? Well, I don't know the ins and outs of that particular operation, but I would assume that would be the case. OK. So if we don't have arrangements with the EU along these lines, that means we're left in the position of having to negotiate bilateral arrangements with different countries, doesn't it? Yeah. I think that's probably for the deputy. Yeah, uh, how long do you think it would take to negotiate bilateral arrangements with all the other 27 EU countries? Well, that's anyone's guess, isn't it, about how long exactly. that will take. That's why it's so important in terms of the work that's been undertaken at the moment that a deal on Europe includes a deal on security and that no deal is just not an option because of what the, <coughs> the legal frameworks that will fall. Those bilateral arrangements will take a long time to put in place these arrangements that we have under Europe are being used and used every day to keep, you know, not just Londoners safer, but actually the, you know, the rest of Britain safe as well. So, so, no, so, so the Mayor is right, to, I think, to set out his six red line options, which are the ones I've, I've mentioned earlier on. And uh, I think you made clear that a no deal is, is a potential disaster for security. Um, and we have to hope that this, when we talk about the government talks about no deal. They don't actually mean no deal at all. They mean a deal on some things that they like, not things that they don't. So I suppose the last question for, for, for both of you is this. Are you preparing for the possibility of no agreement covering these six items? So, I mean, the, the Mayor and the Commissioner were asked this by the Home Affairs <coughs> Select Committee, and um, the answer that uh, the Mayor gave yesterday was that we, we are pushing for this not to be an eventuality. We want security to be, security to be absolutely part of the, you know, the really focused prioritisation around the deals. If we don't have confidence through the transitional arrangement or through um, sort of the beginning of next year, we will have to think about what, what, what do we need to put in place. The Commissioner herself was asked this as well, and she's you know, going to be looking at that. At this stage, we want that to be part of the deal. We will have to look in the early new so, year as to whether that is becoming to fruition. So effectively, the Met is affected by the same uncertainty as I don't know how many other businesses across London who have... Yeah effectively said, unless we get some clear indication by the end of the year, then we have to start preparing because of the uncertainty for all these other eventualities. We'll have to look at what will happen, you know, in the new year, how confident we are that these arrangements are going to be put in place, or if they're not, what needs to happen next. And ju just, just to emphasise that there isn't a, a Met-specific 
no, no. issue here. That, so the work is led by the National Crime Agency. We have, uh, and uh, under the guise of the National Police Chiefs Council, we have a very senior um, person working with that. We have an individual who's expert in this area working with the Home Office team. So we are part of all of that process, which is, which is looking at what the contingencies would be for the various yeah. possible outcomes. So with Brexit, we either need a new treaty covering all these things, or the uncertainty means we've got to do... Think we'll have to have bilateral arrangements. Yeah. Right. Well, one last question, for, almost for the sake of balance, if I may. We've heard two <laughs> different nuances, although I tend to agree, as you would Thanks. expect, in one direction. However, the question I have really, and as I said earlier, to me, and the safety of Londoners and, and people in the UK is the, is the first duty of government. And to me, it would be inconceivable. Um, that um, replacement uh, arrangements would not be negotiated, notwithstanding the comments are made around the, the table. So that will give the opportunity, as I said earlier, to, to build upon and potentially enhance the existing security arrangements. So a question really for Martin as the in-house expert, what other measures do you think we could add to the existing arrangements in our negotiation that you would like to see? Look, I think, I think that we, we would stick with saying the, the suite of arrangements that currently exist is where we need to be to allow us to do what we are doing. Um, you know, I have not given any great time to thinking what additionals. There is, a, there is a suite there, and when you look, and when particularly you go through, whilst the six red lines don't cover the entirety of how the whole thing ties together, when you look at the capability that that gives us, that seems to me to be the kind of capability that we need to be able to deal with the various challenges that are presented by the international nature of crime and particularly the international nature of this city. But the others outside this building who will be tasked with the renegotiation the there is, there is, there is would, whole... would, would, would no doubt go into those rooms uh, with an ambition to indeed enhance potentially. The, the protections we have for those others who are outside this building we're doing so. I'm, Deputy Mayor, I'm trying to look on the sunny side of this, if you permit me. I think to. you're putting a very sunny side on it. I think I, what, I, you know, well, in terms of the MPCC, the NCA, the Met with yeah. and the Home Office, I think their work is cut okay. out to actually get a deal by, no, by yeah. um, March 2019 on these, what are actually incredibly okay, complicated arrangements Accepted. that took a long time. The European arrest warrant took a long time to put in place in the first in the first place. It took years of negotiations with Europe to do that. That's with a body at the body of Europe, not with individual bilateral you know, countries. So I think there is a lot of work to be done and we have to have confidence that that is what is going to be undertaken. I think, I think we've exercised a whole spectrum of views around this, which I think is <laughs> a good thing. So turning now to the next set of questions, which is uh, tackling knife crime, which, as this organisation knows, is the most important, frankly, uh, alongside terrorism, is the most important issue in London at the moment. I know that there was a launch this morning, um, Sophie, so we'll have the opportunity to ask some questions um, around that. And I think, Sean, I think you're leading on this. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, yeah, the September meeting, um, you said you would keep us informed about the progress of your knife crime campaign. So at 6.15 last night, we were very pleased to be told in advance of this meeting that it was launching today. Um, I'll have some <laughs> questions about that in a bit, but if we can focus first on the knife crime education summit that was held recently. Um, this is one of the commitments you made in the knife crime strategy. Um, you're bringing together people from throughout, I think, the education sector specifically. Um, so I wanted to ask, what the outcomes of that summit were, were, what commitments you've made as a result, and what the key messages coming from listening to that sector have actually been uh, from that summit? Yeah, and first of all, I would like to apologise that we didn't invite you, uh, not you personally, but the Police and Crime Committee to that summit. That was an oversight. It was, uh, you should have been, because I think if you had come, you would have found it a very positive uh, summit. So apologies for that, and I will make sure that when we do have other other summits like that that you are invited. In terms of what the outcomes of that, uh, the um, event and the summit were, I think we had some, well, we had, I know we had extremely good engagement and um, interaction with Ofsted. I'm really pleased that Ofsted are, are looking to take a thematic review around knife crime and looking to look at what good practice there is mm -hmm. in schools. We have uh, got, I've got a commitment and, uh, uh, to continue that conversation with Mike Sheridan, who's the regional director of Ofsted, 
I think if that, when that does come to fruition and also looking at the inspection <coughs> framework, that could make a significant difference to what is to the ability of schools to um, educate and to teach and to give pastoral care to those, you know, those pupils and young people that they have within their care. I think that's a really significant step forward in relation to supporting and developing uh, the good practice within schools, because many schools are undertaking this, some schools are not so good at undertaking it. The other thing, the other practical outcome from the summit was that there was a session on developing the toolkit, which will be for educators um, and the community and schools, pupil referral units, to uh, support and back up the knife crime campaign, which has been launched today. That was, um, a, that that, um, that session was extremely productive and is being fed into the development of the toolkit. Great. Thank you very much. Can you tell us, tell us a, <clears throat> a bit more about the Ofsted point? Because I think you're right, that is one of the most in, interesting things to, to have been announced. Um, they're putting together a, a Safer Schools standard or, or a standard to assess how schools are dealing with educating people. Will that include the, the quality and the effectiveness of the messages or will it be more quantitative in terms of how much time schools are putting into this? What we've, dis what we've discussed with Ofsted and what Ofsted are um, going to be undertaking is what they call a, th I'm not an expert in this area at all, so I might get it slightly wrong, uh, is a thematic review on what good practice there is in schools around um, supporting their pupils around knife crime and around violence. So they, they're undertaking that um, sometime in the new year. We are also having discussions with them about what their framework for inspection looks like in terms of safeguarding, what questions they do ask when they go into schools around, around their, you know, there's the framework around safeguarding, what they are actually asking in relation to knife crime and how do they know that their pupils uh, within the schools are being supported and being, um, being helped, helped in terms of the key messages around knife crime. Now that for Ofsted is the safeguarding framework is a critical part of their inspection process. They, have a, they don't go into schools and necessarily assess the, the materials that are being used. They, uh, they ask the questions and assess the, the, you know, the, assess the ability of the school to respond. So, um, but I, I do think that's a really significant step forward. I'm really pleased that we're working with Ofsted on this. And I think it, not only will it ensure that there is that confidence that schools are doing, as many are, what they need to be doing, but I think it will also support schools in terms of good practice. Um. Often we find that um, the trauma of, of having, there having been a crime, um, a, an injury, a death um, in amongst a school community is, is really severe. Will you also be working on ways to, good practice ways for schools to, to deal with that and support pupils um, so that the fear doesn't propagate in the way that we've talked you're about absolutely, You're absolutely right. When there is, a, you know, when there's a death, of a young person or even a significant you know significant in injury it does have a real significant impact on the community that is a school mm -hmm. on the parents on the pupils i've seen it myself firsthand it was a commitment within the knife crime strategy that we would develop that and look at what you know what um, what uh, support schools might have that's something that we need to do we haven't we haven't made significant progress on it at this stage we've been focusing on Ofsted and some of the other aspects of the knife crime strategy but that is absolutely progr programmed in that we will be developing that okay thank you very much um, the other question I have is about other people who come into contact with young people on a regular basis. I think you focus very much on schools and education. Um, how are you engaging with people like young offending teams and youth workers when working on this, this kind of thing and how are you working with them to try and affect and give them the toolkit as well for how they talk to young people? The development of the toolkit, we've had the discussions and the, um, the development of that through the education summit. There were, the, it wasn't just her teachers that were there, there were local authority representatives there. But we will also have, um, we have our own mechanisms via MOPAC around the Children and Young People's Board, but also the regular meetings that we have with heads of community service and, the, you know, through into the local authorities and with local count London councils that we will, we will use to ensure that we are not just focusing on teachers, but also <coughs> focusing, focusing on community leaders and having that ability for youth workers, community leaders to be able to be able to input in this, but also the fact that it won't, this isn't something that will only be di distributed to schools. This is something that's going to be available on the web and available through the internet. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, so moving on to the knife crime campaign, of which I think we can talk about. It was yeah. launched already this morning, <laughs> um, and some of the materials are out there. Um, I accidentally played a little bit of music <laughs> just a little bit ago when I was looking on my phone. My phone was stolen, so I've not quite got to grips with the new settings. So apologies to the whole committee for making that noise. Um, what can you tell us more about the, the campaign? I mean, I've had a look at it. It seems very positive. It seems to be saying to young people, not trying to scare them out of using a knife. It seems to be saying, we we value you. Um, you know, London needs you alive. You're working with a number of influencers who I'm glad to say I don't think those of us in the committee have heard of. So that probably means they're the right people. That young people <laughs> will know who they are. Um, can you can you outline for us? what led to that messaging, um, but also in practical terms, how much are you spending on the campaign, how long will it last? So in terms of the campaign, you're right, absolutely right, this is a positive campaign, trying to get through a positive message to young people, because one, one of the things I'm sure you've heard and I've heard over the years around, from young people around violence and knife crime is the only messages that are often put out and the messages that young people hear is what they are doing wrong, what they, you know, the, the mistakes that they make and the fact that, you know, sort of, so what we wanted to do through this campaign was to actually put a much more positive message that actually we often talk about the diversity of London and the vibrancy of London. Young people make up and are growing, you know, in terms of the increasing number of young people in London. And they are absolutely part of London and part of what makes London fantastic. And that's what this positive message is about. And it really is trying to get through to young people that don't risk your talents and skills by picking up a knife. You must think about why, why you are so important, what it is you give back, what it is you give back to your family, your friends, or to your school. And it's that positive message. We hope that that will be heard. Um, and you're right, it's, um, it's a social media campaign. Um, I hope it will get through to the places that we don't often get through to. Um, I wouldn't, we have got a number of key influencers who I'm told are people that, uh, the, you know, key influencers that young people will listen to. <coughs> It's the early days, obviously it's only just been, um, it's been launched today. I really hope that the positive campaign will actually, actually get through to the people and young people that we need to get through to, as well as giving them a very positive mes message about how much we value young people in London. Mm -hmm. um, will we be able to um, get an impact report um, back? I think your um, overview that you <coughs> gave us said there were going to be two phases of media buying and placement and all of that. Will we be able to look at the results maybe of the first one, see how many people have been reached, whether it whether it has caught on amongst young people in the I'm sure we'll be able to get um, in terms of you know how many people have looked at it, how many people have what we want them to do is take take that um, take that strap line and say for themselves what you know what it is that makes them makes them important, what it is that why London needs them. Um, so I'm sure we'll be able to give you some some of that sort of outcomes around around that and the take up. Okay, that's great. And the final question I have is um, about the fact that the Home Office is developing its own campaign, and we've asked you before about how well you're coordinating <coughs> with them. Um, do you know anything more about their campaign when it's coming out? Have you have you been coordinating with them about the types of messages that you've been using? So we've been in discussion. I, I think I think it's last time you asked me this. We've been in discussions with the Home Office um, about their campaign and absolutely told them what our campaign is. We're continuing those, and we've um, had agreement that it would, you know, that these these campaigns need to align. Um, I don't know when the Home Office campaign is going to come out. Last time I spoke, they were in very early. Spoke to them, they were in very early stages of developing it. Okay, so it's not going to clash with this one in terms of timing. <laughs> well, it may. It, they may produce one in, in terms of at the same time. You know, it's not coming out in the near future, as far as I'm aware. In terms of, um, <clears throat> it may. There may be some overlap but in terms of the messages. We are absolutely in discussions with them and making sure that there is no clash around that. Okay. Um, I have one more question about the wider work you're doing. We've we've talked before, and you've you've mentioned to us that um, you're doing a whole school pilot of different things that you. Um, I can do to educate people about not being involved in, in crime, also violence against women and girls was I think being rolled into the same pilot, although it wasn't 100% clear. Can you give us an update on this, this pilot and, and whether or not it's working, whether you're going to roll it out? The pilot uh, it had its first phase in Croydon uh, with one secondary school and it's, um, uh, it's, it's just going back out and I think we've, I'd, sorry I'd have to double check whether we have 
agreed this yet, but it's about to, you know, in terms of the procurement, but it's about to go, about to set up again, because that was about finding out the concept and what mm. needs, to, needs to happen. Um, and it will be for three years. It will take time to work out whether it's had an impact. Um, I apologise, then. It will take, take time to work out whether it's had an impact. It's a pilot around violence, so that includes knife crime, that does include violence against women and girls. One of the things, the learnings that came out of the initial stages was that this can't just be about school, it has to also be about the parents and the community around the school, mm -hmm. and, that's, um, very, and, be, and it was very much young people led. Um, it will be with one secondary school and I think the four feeder primary schools as well. So that, that is the pilot that um, should be up and running soon. But I can get back to you in terms of the actual details of when. Thank you. Kate. Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's a question for Martin Hewitt, really. Uh, I understand there was around about 12,000 knife crimes in 16-17. And I also understand that there's only about 2,500 people actually proceeded against. Uh, can you shed any light on that? Um, so there obviously has been, you know, there is a high number of, of knife crime and, and we've put an enormous amount of effort in over the last year, particularly the last six months. And we are, I'm pleased to say, starting to see a kind of stabilising in, in, in the level of the criminality. One of the key issues around the investigation and, and, and as you describe as proceeding against is the fact that very, very, very many of our victims are entirely unwilling to engage with police at all. Um, and, I, you know, I can, this is not a new, entirely new phenomenon, but certainly within, within the groups where this, is, where this is predominant, the victims are often just essentially telling us that they're not prepared to even provide a statement to us. So we work around with all try, you know, mechanisms to try and deal with that situation, but that does make um, prosecution quite challenging, obviously, at times. Um, but we will use every other evidential base that we can to try and identify offenders. And we use predominantly the Trident Gang Crime Command, so very specialist command dealing with these, these incidents. But, but the biggest issue that we face is the unwillingness of, of victims to cooperate at all with the investigation. Okay. Uh, probably, uh, well, probably a sort of an unfair question, but just trying to gather information, really. Have you identified certain cohorts or certain groups of people who are more likely to be involved in knife crime? Look, the, the, the fact of the matter is there is there is a gross disproportionality in the violence that is occurring at the moment. Um, and, and the Commissioner um, said this last week at a, a speech at the Howard League for Penal Reform. The vast majority, not exclusively, but the vast majority of the young, mostly boys that are being injured and killed are black young boys. And the majority of those that are the suspects for these incidents are black young boys, not exclusively, yeah. but, but largely and particularly in that long, younger cohort. And that is a real issue yeah. that, that I think we've got to deal with. Could you, could you define that age group that you, you say is young? Well, we, we particularly focus on under 25. So those that are injured with a knife under the age of 25 and that's not in a kind of domestic setting. So that's, that's the cohort that are the one that caused me the greatest concern. Uh, and, and is there any sort of difference in that sort of profile um, between those who have, say, committed violence and those who have committed robbery? There is a real crossover, I think, and what you, would, um, and what you do find is that there'll, there'll be a crossover between robbery offences and violence offences. It's very hard to characterise, and, you know, this is why the knife crime happens. There is a degree to which it will be involved in some of the conflicts between different gangs, different groups, but I think we can, we can potentially overplay that, and we have to be careful not to overplay that. There is a degree to which it is the coming together of young people, and there's some sort of conflict, and, of course, what would in other circumstances be a fight becomes much, much more serious if one or both of those individuals are carrying a knife, and that's why there's such a significant focus through the Knife Crime Action Plan and all the work that we're doing about reducing the number of young people that feel it's either the desirable or the right thing to do to, um, to carry a weapon with them. 
and then there is a crossover into robbery and a crossover into drug dealing activity as well. So it comes as a result of all of those things coming together and often the young people involved are, are involved in various elements of that. You use the term loosely. Um, do you think there are weapons that the police could use to assist them in getting knives off the street? Weapons that we could well, search Well, I'm using the term loosely. Uh, All right. So when I mean weapons, I mean are there uh, tactics that oh. the police could use? Well, there are, there are a whole range of tactics that we use. Um, and you'll be familiar that we are aware that we've been running Operation Scepter over the last mm, period. And, and perhaps it will be helpful to kind of talk through what those tactics um, involve and particular ones there. One of the key tactics that we use with that is what we call weapon sweeps. And this is where, because we know that individuals will often not carry it around routinely, they'll use communal open or closed spaces to um, hide weapons. And we've done, a, we've done a scepter week of activity every month since May. And if you take us through to the 10th of this month, during that period of time, we've, we've undertaken 7,633 weapon sweeps across London. And a fair number of those are what we would describe as community weapon sweep, where we actually work with the people who live in that area and they take part in that process. That's led to the recovery over that period of 159 firearms that we found as a, pro a part of that process and 2,475 knives that we've recovered in that process and then a further 508 offensive weapons. Another significant tool for us in terms of dealing with this is stop and search mm. and we have used targeted and I emphasise that word targeted stop and search <coughs> around those people that we think are either vulnerable to being a victim or and we have a group where we identify what we call habitual knife carriers. So we have some intelligence or information that suggests to us that this individual is someone who is habitually carrying knives and obviously in, in all the, the operational activity. So again, during that period and during those, um, those operational weeks of activity, we've conducted just over, just under 9,500 stop searches during that period. And in all of that period, again, not just from the stop search, but we've arrested just over 4,000 people. So a combination of those that we know to be habitual knife carriers, focusing on those places and locations where we know there is a vulnerability to knife crime being undertaken or being uh, taking place, the gang work that we do around those people that we know are involved in that, the weapon sweeps, we are also and have made a, a slightly larger use of the Section 60 stop and search power, which is the power that allows us to designate a specific geographic area for a specific period of time. <coughs> and then within that geographic area, the normal suspicion requirements that you would need for a Section 1 search are not required. And that would only be based on us having very clear information or intelligence that we fear that there is some sort of coming together that's going to happen at that point where we think it is in the interest of public safety for us to do that and that would be controlled and time limited. Have you done any analysis in relation to stop and search especially where you've employed a section, six, a section six, 60 where um, after a given period. Sorry, how long does the Section 60 last for? Well, they can last for 24. 24 hours is, is the kind of what you would authorise, but we would generally look at them after a 12-hour period. They're reviewed by a senior officer right, so to make a, a decision. Short, but short but they, are, they are short, and we will, we right. will um, revoke the 60 power as soon as the perceived threat is, is okay. no longer present. So that doesn't really help what I was going to say. But um, if we look at the... Uh, a section one stop and search then, but in one where you've designated an area where you're going to do section mm. uh, stop and search because you've identified some gaps yeah. or whatever. Ha have you find that after uh, the initial stop and searches that it becomes, um, you, you, are, you find fewer knives or weapons as the period progresses? So what I'm trying to say is does it also work not only as a means of detection, but yeah. as a means of deterrent as well? I, th 
I think there is a degree to which it can be a deterrent. I think it's really hard to make those causal links all the way through. I think if I'm, you know, if I'm honest, it is a, it is a, it is a prevention technique. And let's be frank, it is, you know, there is no doubt that taking knives out of people's pockets is saving other people's lives. So it is a, it is a power that we need to utilise. But I think it also is it's suppressive rather than long-term prevention. I think it is a suppressive power. And that's why you know, we are so committed to working with getting to a place where where we get to is less people are carrying knives around with them because that's fundamentally where we, need, yeah. where we need to get ourselves to, which is why all the education work that we just spoke about and all the other work that we do with other groups is really important. But section, or section one predominantly, or section 60, but stop and search, has to be a tool that we are effectively using and doing it in the right way. And I, I really would stress as well, in those areas where knife crime is prevalent, we get very strong community support about using stop and search powers and wherever we can particularly if it's pre-planned we will have community members with us observing and being part of that process in terms of so, undertaking that so just one last question um in relation to stop and search and its its ability to perhaps prevent people carrying knives do you, do you feel that part of, the, part of the problem is not so much that someone carries a knife in order to commit a crime, but because they feel the need to carry it as a means of defence, and that if you can create an area or, a, or a, uh, an atmosphere, probably not the right word, but uh, where the young people don't feel threatened or go therefore don't need to carry a knife, that in itself is... is would reduce the amount of crimes, albeit that the person who's carried the knife has no intention of using it uh, offensively, often they become the victims of their own knife. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think it's quite hard talking about making area, you know, making area, you know, I don't want to get us into designating it, but, but the, your point... The word I meant was environment. I, yeah, actually, your point is absolutely yeah. right in that I don't think many of the young people that go out carrying a knife go out with an intention that I am going to stab somebody with this weapon. I don't think that's the case at all. And everything that we can understand tells us that in a lot of cases, people are carrying them, A, because they feel they need to to protect themselves. I think there is also a bit of a status thing as well that we need to recognise and be clear about. And I think that takes you into some of the discussion that's very live at the moment around the kind of videos that, that, that run. So there is a bit of a status thing, but I think the vast majority of people feel in their heads, I need to carry this to protect myself. The reality is that's the last thing that it's doing because it is putting you in danger. It's ramping up any conflict that you get. And, and as you say, potentially you even get that knife used on you. So, which is why overall creating that atmosphere, environment, whatever we want to call it, where people feel less that they need to, and really I think the whole point of the campaign, less that you want to, you are rationalising and thinking about, I'm not going to do that, is where we've got to get to. Because, you know, the numbers that I've given you about the number of knives we've found, the, the, ch the difference between knives and guns is, knives are, we could all go now in the next 20 minutes and have a weapon that was capable of really seriously injuring somebody, because the knives are everywhere. It's not like the guns, where there are many more control mechanisms you can put in place. So we've got to get people into a situation where they are not seeing it as either the thing they want to do or the thing they feel they need to do, because that's, that's what will then start to reduce it. Sorry, there was just one other question, um, and it's around the LAS. The LAS are doing some very good work in schools, yep. and it's around educating uh, young people it's not about if you carry a knife you may die because you know young people don't have a sense of mortality or no they don't um, but it, it explains what life-changing injuries occur to children or young people when they when they carry knives uh, and that seems to be quite effective is, is there any work that you're doing with the LES to maybe roll that out across London or certainly in the areas where there's... Uh, yeah, well, we, I mean, we work with LAS on a whole range of different things. Our schools officers are giving exactly, not necessarily the, the issue about the injuries, but are giving the inputs that they give in all the schools around responsible decision-making, 
um, and how you actually take that forward. And then we've got a whole bunch of other programmes that are linked in to the knife crime strategy around how you're getting this information out to young people and how they understand the implications of carrying a, a weapon. And we, we, you know, we, we use all sorts of creative ways to try and bring that forward into people's minds. There's also work to try and get that into parents as well, because um, you know, sadly in some instances you hear of parents encouraging children to carry the knife for protection. So we need to, this is a, this is a collective, young people, parents, communities, schools, collectively coming together and, and, and kind of, I think, you know, driving the messages that the campaign is trying to drive around taking the sensible decisions around carrying knives. Thank you. Uh, just for the people in the audience, the LAS, I should have said, correct. the LAS is the ambulance <laughs> service. It's good people in the audience. Very, very much welcome. Kingston University students. Uh, this morning, Tony, you'd be interested. My son Andrew. goes there. Yes. <laughs> okay. So well, welcome, welcome, this, welcome this welcome this morning. Questions. That was very thorough, and thank you for the responses there. Peter, you want to come in? Yes. Just a couple of questions, uh, Martin. Um, you mentioned that the community that you work with very much supports, you know, stop and search and what have you. Um, can you just tell me what, how formal is that community interaction? I mean, when you say the community, you, you mentioned schools. But yeah. Uh, presumably it would include churches as well, maybe? Yes. Could you just... just so, uh, the reality is, at a, on a local level, at a whole, uh, to a whole range of groups, obviously the schools, yes, faith groups that are, that are involved locally. In each borough you'll have an independent advisory group who no doubt will, um, will have a view around these kind of issues. And on many of the boroughs, you also have um, a stop and search monitoring group who are specifically community members, and particularly people from those communities that, are, that feel most impacted by stop and search, and they will be part of working with the police. So it's not unusual to have operations where we know we're going to go to a particular location, do a fair degree of stop and search, where you would have people, you know, community members wearing tabards and identifying who they are, and they will then talk to some of the people that we stop to get a sense of, of the perception. But I think everyone recognises that police officers using their powers lawfully and appropriately to remove knives from people is positive. There was a, and I can't remember which evening, relatively recently, there was a debate about knife crime on Channel 4 News that I saw, and there was a community lady there, and, and she absolutely summed it up for me, because she said, I've never had a problem with the police doing stop and search. The issue is how they do stop and search. Mm -hmm. And I think if we do stop and search um, badly, crudely, rudely, disrespectfully, then it causes problems done properly. I think everyone recognises it as a technique and a tool that we should be legitimately losing to protect, or using, should I say, to protect people. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, when you were responding to, um, to the question about age and, you know, the co age cohort, it's up to 25, below yeah, we, 25. Yeah, that's what we look at specifically. I know that it's a, how long's a piece of string and all the rest of it, but at what age would you say, if there is common age, when does the problem first start to come into play? I mean, I know that this is a very wide area, but if you're talking about prevention being better uh, than cure and what have you, at what age would our young, the young men, yeah. um, mostly young men, Predominantly. what age would you say this is starting to be a feature? I would say that we could provide um, a reasonably good number of examples that take you down to probably sort of 12, 13. Um, but an important point for me is, by the time a young person is 12 or 13, their views and their, their, their attitudes around issues like this are, are fairly well set. And I was at the, um, the Education Summit and got the chance to speak at the Education Summit. And one of the points that's really important to me is that the work we're doing in schools starts in primary schools and I think particularly with year five and year six children who are about to transition into secondary school because I think at that point those children will definitely be aware of the issue they will be seeing some of that dependent on you know on where where they're living and we need to be starting to get those messages about how they can be responsible to themselves how they can look after themselves at that stage but is but I, Sorry. No, no. But I think in terms of where we see it manifesting itself in criminality, you're, it's the sort of 12, 13 age group. So they've already got used to, as it were, the idea of it by then. 
So, I mean, without, I know you're not a sociologist, uh, despite what people say about the piece, but uh, can you just tell me what, do you have any observations about the various events that might happen around that time that would actually tend to coincide with when young people start to get involved? Is it purely because they are 12, 13 year olds, you know, when they're kind of becoming you know, adolescence and all the rest of it, or is it something else? I mean, is it a family breakdown? Is it, is it, is it something like this that happens? What I, I just noticed is, obviously, talking about mostly young, young uh, black guys, and, you know, often they grow up with a very strong moral framework, you know, and then something seems to go wrong, maybe, and then the knives come in. What, is this something that you've observed or, 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 or not? Um. <laughs> So, I'm talking very generally because yeah. you have to. You know. And certainly for the benefit of any national newspapers, I am not a sociologist, I'm a police officer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> I, the, the point I would make is, you know, everyone at that age, everyone at that age is rebelling, everyone at that age is more worried about what their friends are doing, everyone at that age is, is doing what they do. Yeah. I think there, there are undoubtedly issues around the peer groups the individuals are in, there are things around what they're seeing around them where the role models are around them, what they see as normal behaviour around them, all of those things come into play. And it's one of the issues that concerns me almost more than anything. This is a very, very concerning issue that this amount of violence is taking place on our streets. It's really concerning that young people. It is particularly concerning that it seems to be focused in certain groups of young people. And I do think we all need to look collectively at why is it that that is the experience that those young people are, are going through as opposed to others. But what all the factors that play into that are complex and there's lots of research out there, but I think it's about how we try and tackle those and give those people the chance to have, you know, have a positive development as opposed to this. So one, one more question, sorry. Um, Shah mentioned this, uh, the video or something. I haven't seen it, can no. video. But I mean, are there certain, you know, incredibly well thought of celebrities and such like that you could I'm thinking of someone like uh, Anthony Joshua are these sort of people could you not get them involved I mean these would be amazing if you want role models would they not Wait, have you tried with him is there anyone that wants to get involved as a role model but have you promote? approached him we I don't think we have approached him specifically he was actually in trouble at. when he was a kid he was we sorry he was no, he was, no, he was and he's had spoken about yeah, that so yeah no, absolutely we we are keen for anybody who is a positive influence on young people to get involved with our campaign we want it so we don't we don't have to be approached to get involved it's if it's out there please do people need to be asked though it's just a, it's yeah, just an idea absolutely you need to be a perfect but just in, yeah just in terms of you know what are the issues or why are some young people be, um, making the wrong choices and uh, deciding to carry a knife or get involved in violence as Martha said, there's lots of research out there, but one of the things we do know, and it happens a lot when you look, look back over young people's history, is that one of the things we do know that's often, not always, there's no, n there's no sort of es you know, set route to um, becoming violent or carrying a knife, but often there's bereavement in the family, often there's domestic violence in the family or in the family home, and these are issues, or there's trauma that hasn't been dealt with. Those are often the, some of the complex issues that it's, you know, are part of the background of young people that then make the wrong decisions. What we're trying to do by working with primary schools, working with secondary schools, is to put that support into schools and into families and into, you know, for children to make sure that they are supported where they have those needs. It is very difficult. Mental health services have been, you know, how under incredible pressure and strain and actually a lot of the support that young people need is around mental health services, either to deal with trauma or bereavement that they've, 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 they've had. It's very difficult. We all know about the waiting list. Child and mental health, adult mental health, adolescent mental health services, they can do fantastic work, but they need the capacity and resources to do that. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And beyond that point, I mean, last week, I mean, we lost a young person uh, in Croydon uh, a couple of weeks ago. We had a community meeting in North Croydon last week. Jeff Booth addressed it. And the atmosphere in the room was so different um, than five years ago when Stop and Search was raised. This was a room, 70, 80 people, full, very passionate, very upset, supportive of Stop and Search, appropriately. And I think that was a, a sign of how far, I'm not speaking for them, but how far the communities <coughs> have moved. Did you want to ask a question? I've got a couple more points, but do you want to come in, Mesh? Oh, yes. I mean, sadly, last week, um, we had yet another knife-related murder uh, in Newham, an area that I represent um, uh, on the authority. Uh, my question really is to you, uh, Deputy Mayor. 
Uh, Martin touched upon the role of parents. And can I come in all the work that you and your uh, team are doing around all the various summits, the campaigns, uh, some fantastic work going on there. Um, but have you considered, or will you consider um, make, giving parents and relatives of victims a more central role in these various campaigns? Because after all, nothing can substitute for their personal experiences. Uh, no commercial agency, no matter how much they try, can, uh, can, can have that same sort of personal sort of experience. Some of the most moving speeches, most passionate anti nice speeches, and understandably so, that I've heard have come from parents speaking to school children and so on. Uh, and the, the family of the, of the young man who was murdered in my land, I think we had some contact with the family, this was a few months ago, they did set up a campaign. Uh, what happens is sadly this campaign's flounder for various reasons, not least lack of resources. Uh, so my specific question to you is that will you consider giving parents, families uh, a much more central role uh, um, in all these campaigns? I think the idea that you have a modern uh, slavery ambassador in Shpara. I think it's a fantastic idea, and we have discussed it with people outside at various meetings I've spoken over the last couple of weeks in East London. People have uh, responded very warmly to that concept. Um, so something along those lines, bringing families together, uh, maybe in a London-wide forum. Um, I don't expect you to give me straight answers now, but I'm just asking you to take my point on board. I completely agree with you, and actually the development of the campaign that's been launched today, we have... In, in, As we had at your summit in Houston last year. Yeah, we've in, and we've yeah. always engaged with the, the yeah. parents, brothers yeah. and sisters yeah. and aunties and uncles of uh, young people who've mm. lost their lives. Yvonne Lawson and Brooke Kinsella were there, to, were there yeah. this morning as part of the launch of the campaign. We will also be shortly going out and launching the community seed funding, which we had as part of a commitment within the knife crime strategy. And that's very much aimed at very small local mm. groups, local mm. voluntary groups, mm. um, and what work they can do. You know, mm. We hope that what will come forward mm. is some, um, some projects and programmes which will help parents mm. not just give a message out about mm. the difficulties and the absolute traumatic impact <coughs> that Knife <coughs> Crime has, mm. but also give them the support and some of the, you know, some, well, some of the support and advice that they need to keep their own children safe. Okay, thank you can, for I, that. Can, I, can I just make one observation, sorry, Quickly. With, the, with the campaign and everything, I mean, it's just, it seems, it's terribly important that, uh, you know, when you say that, you know, you're valued and it's terribly important, you know, that's the, but it's also very important that the, these young boys are not, are not uh, considered to be losers, do you know what I mean? It's, it, you know, it's a very important part, particularly given the context often of this night, about masculinity and everything that, you know, that they... This is why I mentioned, drone on about the likes of Anthony Josh. Basically, strong, you know, you are going to be strong, you know, you are a proper man, all the rest of it. That's terribly important to, to those young boys, not to be considered poor or losers or victims or anything. Campaign you know? too, sure. You just wrote the campaign speech that is the campaign this morning. The theme that, that right. I believe that <laughs> I believe <laughs> that I believe <laughs> well done, Peter, because you're on the same same page. Same on the same page, the campaign <laughs> theme is, is about the the, the, the the valuation of the lives of the, by those people themselves that they are they have value and, and should not um, pursue this sort of course. Just to other people, you know, to no, himself. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. On the boxing point, which is a very strong point, I think it's well known, in fact, in London, boxing is being very supportive mm. of clubs. I'm taking yes. some people along to a Gloves Not Guns group, charity group in, in, in North. We, we work North all across London. Yeah. There's a massive event that happens in, in uh, Alexander Palace that Sophie and I were at last summer, where we end up with the biggest amateur boxing competition, but the day before yeah. is all young people from across London. Anthony Joshua came on the, as did Nicola Adams, um, and we work with... Yeah, sorry. We work with um, we work with all sorts of others, and with football. We work with all the London football clubs, working with young people in both within the clubs and in schools, and we will exploit every opportunity to get people out there as role models. But I do think it's really important, equally, to have role models that are in the community, because we can all look and see Anthony or see a professional footballer, but most people aren't going to become professional footballers or top sports people but so they're good as icons but I think we need community role models who have achieved and who are you know, leading fulfilled lives. We've possibly gone through the process that's the most powerful point. The last question and request really so we're, we're, we're obviously very interested in the education summit and thank you for giving some details around that. I've no doubt that the um, details were minuted by your office. We'd like some full details. If you could write to it, someone to write to us perhaps with the, with the transcript or the outcomes of that meeting, not word for word, but 
We're, we're really fascinated by it, and we would like a bit more detail. Maybe. We can give you more detail. Yeah. I don't think there's a transcript. No, a transcript, perhaps detail. not, but, but yeah. some more detail around it. And thank you, and it's worth exercising that subject. Um, moving on to the next subject, which is again something that we've looked at in the committee's moped enabled crime. Um, I think what was quite startling to me on the table I have was the disparity between some boroughs, the, the top five boroughs, which I know Andrew's going to talk about. Um, one of my boroughs in Sutton over a period is 41, and others are in the thousands. So, Andrew, did you want to? Uh, yes, thank you. Well, uh, Camden, which is one of the boroughs I represent, has got 100 times as many as you have um, in, in, in Sutton. Camden had over 4,000 between January and September uh, uh, Merpo crime enabled offences. Islington, three and a half thousand. Between them, they account for more than half, mm. uh, nearly half of those across London. I don't suppose, in parentheses, it's a very good advert for the merged BCU that the two worst offenders are Camden <laughs> and Islington. But, but parking that to one side, we're starting to see the moped crime going beyond pavement snatching. Mm -hmm. In uh, Camden, we've seen shops being, um, yep. uh, being stormed by moped criminals to steal laptops out of uh, people sitting at, having a cup of coffee in a yep, cafe from... Uh, the Apple Store last week, with a, a major raid stealing thousands of pounds of laptops and and uh, and, and uh, mobile phones. And um, what I'd like to just briefly read an email I got the other day from one of my constituents, which is typical of quite a few I received recently, from a woman called Jessica. She writes this: "I wanted to get in touch with you as I'm going increasingly concerned about the spate of increasingly aggressive and violent moped attacks taking place across London." but particularly where I live in Belsize Park, one, an area one would have thought not a grime hotspot. I've all, uh, I personally had a near miss last week and almost did report it to the police as I felt there was nothing they could or would do. This is despite the fact that most of my friends who live in the area have been a victim or have witnessed this sort of crime. However, after having heard about the robbery on Monday in Highgate in which two assailants smashed their way into bakery on an afternoon, I was compelled to write to ask you what the Mayor is doing to combat this. Currently, it appears to the public, and I'm sure the assailants too, that they commit these sorts of crimes with impunity. I've never felt afraid of walking the streets of London, but now it feels like an increasingly frightening prospect. Now, that's a typical email I'm receiving from constituents about this from, from Camden. And it seems to me that, the, that the, the moped thieves are becoming more inventive, more aggressive, more brazen, more violent, and consequently, as this constituent indicates, Jessica, more frightening. So what is being done to tackle this? Because it seems to be getting worse, not better, more frequent, not better. And, and, and people do think there is no way you're going to catch these people, both the assailants and the public. OK, so um, well, it isn't, it is, we have actually now started to see some reductions in both, because there's two elements to this. There is the element which is the, the stealing of the scooter in the first place because clearly that's what's facilitating them. And then you've got the criminality that, that comes after that. It's a very significant focus for us. As you point out, they're doing a range of criminality. So you had the kind of basic snatches, if I can call it that. You've then got snatches where there's more violence involved, and we've now seen the, the offences in relation to particular, um, particular premises. But the, we've, since the last sort of six months, we've been focusing very hard on this. You've got, over the last three months, the, the theft of the mopeds themselves has gone down by 11%, and the, theft, the, the consequent crime has gone down by 12%. We are now starting equally to see um, some good convictions on these offences, and that's starting to get a little bit of publicity as well, which I think is helpful. There's no doubt this has been picked up by the media, and every time there is an offence now, it's getting, it's getting um, more prominent. We've attacked it from a number of issues. A number is about dealing with the individuals that we know, and we do operations not only around the individuals that we know are involved in this, because back to our earlier conversation around violence, some of the same individuals are the ones who are involved in this criminality, so you can do that proactive targeting. Targeting those people that we know are helping them with the, with the scooters, very large prevention campaign around scooters and the Be Safe campaign that we now badge all of our crime prevention. The last one was specifically around scooters and the theft of them. The challenge with them is there's loads of them and unlike motorbikes, which people love their motorbikes, they don't really care, generally speaking. The scooters are very much a commuting, put it, go away, 
and they're not high value items. So we've worked really hard with the community of people that use the, the scooters and the mopeds to try and get them to do what they can do to prevent these things being stolen in the first place. So you'll have seen some of the, the stuff that's on the streets and by the, the places where the scooters are locked up. Lots of campaigning work around that. Work being done in conjunction with the mayor's office and, and, and at a national level, working with the industry about what the industry can do to actually make the vehicles less easy to steal, because the problem is they're very easy to steal at the moment. And then bearing down tactically around how we can deal with it. It is not true to say that we cannot pursue people that are on scooters. That is not the case. But as with any pursuit that a police officer will engage in, they are conducting that continuous dynamic risk assessment about the danger to the person they're pursuing, to members of the public, to themselves, and having to make that decision. And what we've seen and what everybody has seen in the media footage that gets out there, incredibly reckless riding by individuals on scooters. We've got the officers that are trained. We've got a process now where we're able to better monitor those with tactical advice sitting in the control centre. And we're also introducing new tactics as well, which you will have seen, no doubt, from when the Commissioner um, launched those. So the, the sort of stinger, the thing that deflates the tyres, we've got a new, better, more deployable version of that piece of equipment. And we've also got an ability now to spray individuals with um, a kind of smart water um, substance that allows us to then go on and do the investigative work. So there is a, there's a huge amount of activity. You're absolutely right, this emanated in Camden Islington was, you know, way back was where this first started to emerge as a crime type. It's been picked up now and that coverage is much greater. It's not all over London and it certainly isn't proportionately all over London, but it has spread, I think partly because of some of the publicity it's received and because, as I say, the, the scooters themselves are fairly easy to deal with. So operationally, loads of activity. Um, and investigatively, loads of activity, lots of prevention activity, and working with the industry to hopefully try and progress that forward. And it's just something that we will maintain a focus on to try and keep bringing that down. And as I say, in the last three months, we've started, we've seen a, a suppression, and hopefully we can we can continue that. But it is incredibly resource intensive. They are very brazen, and and it really is one of the. I think it's, it's, it's a very, very bad when you see the images of, of these kind of offences. Um, they're, they're very bad, and we, I understand entirely how negative that is for public confidence, and, and the experience that you read from your constituent there is, is I know, one that is, is, is not unique by any stretch of the imagination. So we are bearing down with it as much as we can. Well, thanks for the answer, but even with a 12% reduction, that still means in Camden an average of 10 offences a day. Yep. So it's still a high number. And, and perhaps you could let me have the number of arrests that have been made in relation to those incidents, in, particularly in Camden, but also yeah. London Wide would be very helpful. Yeah, I can but, get but, but, but the concern I have is, is we've now seen this new trend of business premises, shops, cafes being, being besieged and broken into and stormed by moped-enabled uh, villains. Yeah. And what I am really concerned about is people think they're in a safe place working on their computer, having a cup of coffee, and the next thing they know, they're subjected to a violent attack with a hammer to steal their laptop. That's a different scale of crime altogether, and that's because it's not been got a grip of earlier. So I'd like to know also to what extent these new tactics have actually worked. In the, I know it's not been in operation all that long. In yeah. terms of actually how many people have you arrested as a result of these new tactics? Yeah, oh, well, I, can get, I haven't got all of those, those figures, and... I, and um, I'll get the arrest figures around, uh, particularly around Camden Islington. Um, you know, we had arrest last night with, with an attack in Westminster on premises, um, where they'd, they'd, they'd attempted on one premises, then attempted on a second. They were they were picked up by officers who who noticed the um, the unusual kind of the way they were riding in convoy and the way they were riding around. The individuals there assaulted one of the police officers, attempted to assault the other police officers. Have all been arrested but they were very young individuals, so it is a real challenge. But we are working, we're working with, um, you know, with, with businesses, we're working with the, the prevention side and the operational activity. But it is, uh, you know, there have always been, to some extent, the kind of smash and grab type 
um, offences, but this is obviously a very quick and easy method for people to move around. So we are we're doing everything that we can possibly do to try and deal with that. We have seen some reductions, but we have to keep those going and we have to improve them. Well, it's much grab your right has been around, you know, but we're now talking about not raids on jewellery shops. Mm. Uh, no. We're not talking about people lifting an unguarded handbag as they walk past as an opportunist theft in a coffee shop. We're now talking about people no, I understand that. Being, being besieged. So coming back to your risk analysis of when you chase people, is one of the factors you look at what they have apparently done. Um, on the one hand, grabbing somebody's phone out of their yeah. hand when the street is not pleasant. Next stage will be threatening with a hammer to grab it, or as we've seen, next stage beyond that would be violently attacking people mm -hmm. in, a, in, in a premises like this, effectively a, a, an aggravated burglary, I suppose. Does it, is the seriousness of what they've done one of the factors you take into account in the risk analysis of whether you pursue somebody? Well, it always would be, because clearly you are, you know, to pursue anybody is, is generating risk. There is a risk to the way, you know, from the way that, from what the police officers are doing, there's a risk of what that consequently, the result of the way the, the individual who's being pursued drives, whether that's in a car or in a, in a, on a scooter. And so one of the factors that you would play into that process is obviously the nature of the offence that you, that, that they are believed to have taken part in. That's just one of the factors that you're trying to, to bring together to what is a very, very challenging balancing act in terms of making a decision around what the right thing to do is. Are you pursuing more people than they used to do? Um, I think the answer to that is yes. I don't know the exact figure. I think the answer to that is yes. Well, well, can we have the figures of the number yeah, of, of pursuits, both London-wide and also like to have that for, for the Camden offences as well, for yeah, obvious yeah. reasons, but London-wide as well. Um, we've got the numbers of offences uh, over, the, over the nine months. January to September, it's useful to have the number of pursuits. Is that specifically scooters that you're talking about? Uh, yeah, it's scooters. Well, scooters and motorbikes, I suppose. In pursuits, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, since your new tactics came in, uh, the, the comparative numbers, both of offences and, uh, yeah. and pursuits, well, I think it would be very helpful to have those details. Yep. Um, thank you. Um, just a couple of follow-up um, questions. Um, one is about communication. Um, and making, in, in a similar way to the, the knife crime, making sure that there is positive communication from officers and to the public about the things that you are doing. Um, I mean, the example I'll give is, um, Andrew is my local assembly member for Camden and Barnet, but the area where I live is actually on the border between Camden, Islington and Haringey. Um, the attack mentioned on the cafe in, in Highgate, very close to where I live, um, that was actually on the Haringey side of the border. Um, and I know you've got, I mean, we've been getting very good communication on this from our Camden officers about what's been going on, lots of positive steps that are being taken. You know, nobody feels hopeless in Camden particularly because they are being well informed about what's been going on. But I think when that attack happened, and this was reported in the newspapers, Haringey response officers turned up and effectively told the people on the scene in that cafe, having been attacked by hammers, there was nothing they could do because they couldn't chase them. And I think this message that chasing is the only answer, that um, you know, if you can't chase, there is nothing you can do. That's, I know for a fact from, from my own casework that this is affecting people's willingness to report crimes, which if these are organised gangs is going to affect your intelligence and your ability to investigate crimes. So can I make a plea that you in, um, give good information about how to communicate this to all officers, not just the ones in your specialist teams, because a council of despair, I don't think, is going to help anybody on this, because things will just start to not even be reported, and the level of reporting we've got is scary, but I, I worry that in Camden it's even higher. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I agree entirely, and I mean, you know, I can't answer for all the individual interactions every officer is having, and that, that would not be what I would be advocating they would be saying, because, as you say, a, it's factually inaccurate, and B, pursuing is not the only option, and there are all sorts of activities. So, well, can certainly look at making sure that that information is as good as it is in the in the one instance, in the others. So. That would be really good. And yeah. I think because because it's so high profile and it's in all the newspapers, mm -hmm. everyone in London needs this communication, not just in the boroughs that are being targeted. Um, my final question, and this comes again from. Um, resident feedback. Um, one of the residents said that in, 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 in other countries, in other cities, when they've had a problem with um, moped-enabled crime, they've, for a period, a temporary period, um, made it illegal to carry pillion passengers 
um, in, in order to make it easier to identify who might be criminals, i.e. people defying the ban and more likely to be people than you might stop them. Um, and I don't have a view on this tactic myself, but I, I said I would put it to you and see what you thought and whether that was legally possible for London. Um, <laughs> well, we don't, we don't get to make the laws. Um, yeah. I think it's I think it's got to be proportionate, hasn't it? That, you know, law I think it, I mean, I'm a transport campaigner, so like <laughs> I'm, I'm making it un impossible to do too well. But actually, maybe for a temporary time or in, in uh, across a temporary area, you might say if we're going to regard you as suspicious if you do that. I don't know. I mean, I mean adding to that, I've had recommendations, and it's interesting you mentioned it, that, that not saying a ban, but your officers should be finding reasons to stop anyone with a pillion mm -hmm. uh, to have a conversation with them. You know, so it's the same. It's the same theme, isn't that's it? That's exactly. Yeah. But, but this I don't is know always going to come back to what is proportionate because you don't mm. want to go so far one way. We've ha had a conversation about stop and search, and previously there had been too. You know, the level of stop and search had been too. It had been too much of a blanket stop and search. You could be in danger of that, but you just have to have a proportionate response. But clearly, I mean, you can see from the figures, it is really worrying, and concerning. Early stages that we are there is a slight reduction. Yeah. But actually, even with a slight reduction, it is far too high. So we've got to make sure that the police tactics are yeah. sustained dis and work. I mean, it's a disproportionate crime in itself, yeah. might need disproportionate. So the point you made, I mean, the, the, and as I, I just said with the, that, um, the circumstances from last night in Westminster, that was because officers were looking at the behaviour of people that were on scooters. Yeah. Um, so I think there are all sorts of ways that we can engage in conversations with people. The officers know what they are looking at or looking for, should I say, in terms of, um, in terms of unusual behaviour that would cause a concern to you. And that, that's, what, that's what they're doing, because we're, everyone is very... And the key bit is we want to get hold of people before they start moving on the vehicles. That's the best time to get hold of people, because once they start moving, then obviously you have all the challenges that, we've, um, that we have talked about. But what we have had is a commitment from, um, from the police minister to look at the issues around what happens with officers when there is a pursuit, and when that pursuit results in results in injury or or even death to individuals because again in the heads of our police officers one of the things they are calculating is where this potentially leaves them if they do engage in in a pursuit yeah. and so that that's the policing minister is looking at that and and we've we've written back all the deputy commissioners written back to the police Maybe minister and welcomed that well, just to follow up from from sean's suggestion which i think is an interesting one about um, not having people on the back of a pillion. Well, I don't think you necessarily you would need a law to do that, but is there not a case for saying in areas where you do have a high incidence of this crime for a more aggressive stop and search policy of people on yeah. pillion, riding pillion, um, if you stop them and they're carrying a knife or, or a hammer, well, yeah. they may need to have a pretty good excuse for doing so. Yeah, and perhaps in, in those particular areas, in that new BCU, which is, uh, as I say, wasn't yeah. a very good advert for this. Uh, it might be an idea to do it in a, in a selective way. And I think that I think that is essentially what I am describing. I would be very disappointed if you can go and find any Camden or Islington officer who doesn't realise this is a priority for them to deal with, well, and I'm, that I'm, they shouldn't be proactive if they spot people on a scooter that they don't like the look of. Well, I'm sure that, I'm sure that's the case, but um, perhaps stopping people, at, you know, and, and, and having a quick word with them isn't happening. Yeah. Often as it perhaps it could do. Uh, well, uh, I, I, I if, cannot. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're up to no good and you're riding a pillion and you think there's a good chance of being stopped before you commit a crime, you're less likely to do it. That's the point I made earlier. I think, yeah. as with stop and search, officers should have the confidence to use their professional judgment where there is high crime in Camden and Islington, it's mopeds, in other areas, it's knife crime, and Camden and Islington does have an issue with knife. They should, what the message is you should have the confidence to use your powers and use every power you can to intervene as early as possible when you think a crime is going to be committed. Yeah. But clearly it does have to be intelligence-led, it does have to be proportionate, but absolutely have the confidence to use it yeah. because it is needed. Yeah, I mean, stop and search isn't just stopping people on the pavement. Yeah, no, not no, at all. Yeah. And that, that's what, yeah. but, but again, it's, it, you know, there, and there is a lot of proactive work with plainclothes officers dealing with this all the time at the, the right times in the right places. But, but all of this is within the bounds of, of what resource availability we've got to, to obviously do that more on, proactive work. Question. Yeah, I wanted just to pick up that in the volume is huge, 17,500. It's more than doubled, and some months it's trebled since the start of this year. These new tactics you're using, how many of these mobile stingers have you got? You haven't mentioned the 
new purpose-built bikes. We're told there are four of them. Doesn't really sound like that's a huge resource going into tackling this, or is this a pilot that's going to be rolled out within Super months? Bikes. So the um, so the the stingers and the the um, the sprays will be on every borough, so everyone will have availability to use those. Clearly, the the unmarked bikes, which give us a capability, we're not going to have loads of those, and we need the people that are suitably qualified and trained to ride those those bikes. So they're there as an additional tactic where we either have intelligence that we know there is potentially going to be an issue, or we have an area where it's particularly prevalent in that issue. It gives us another tactic to try and deal with the, the, the crime and try and prevent the crime, and to give us a greater capability in terms of pursuit around individuals. But that, that is, that's within a, a small group of people that we obviously have that are capable of of that kind of um, that kind of operating, that's not something you would give out more generally. Right, so these four new purpose-built yep. bikes are for pursuits in certain boroughs. Presumably, they're in Camden. And we, we would use them in an intelligence-led way, where we think they that particular capability will give us an enhanced chance of, of actually either preventing or or okay. catching. You don't plan to roll it out to other high areas. Uh, not to my knowledge is the answer. I don't want to, I, but I would suspect that's a fairly high level training requirement to have a, a motorcyclist who's capable of doing that and in the circumstances we would want them to do that. <laughs> Riding police motorcycles unmarked is, is obviously quite a dangerous activity and we need the people to be fully trained. So I would, that would be where we would use that, where we've either got particular operational activity, you've got a particular problem or a, or a particular um, high crime area, we can use those in those environments but it would be very much targeted rather than a universal. What advice and support are you giving to businesses where, as I say, the crime seems to be changing, as, as um, Andrew has outlined, this whole issue that you can be sitting, having a coffee somewhere, and suddenly someone's coming in threatening yeah. um, and snatching stuff. What advice are you giving to businesses in order to make sure that their customers are safe? Well, I think, I think on the, that would come as part of the normal relationship and advice we have with any business around keeping safe, but I think we've equally got to be realistic that if you're going to get a group that are, are that brazen and prepared to do that, I'm not sure what we would be saying to the business they need to be doing. We need to just make sure everyone is aware of that. We need to make sure our officers are aware that that threat exists right, and that they're doing what they can do in terms of the prevention and the, and the kind of detection work that we do. But, and then it would form part of that general, the general kind of crime prevention work that we do with, with all businesses. Can I just put it, put it in con I mean, I put it in a bit of context as well because we've had the discussion about knife crime, really, really serious and worrying and concerning. The increase there as well, moped crime, absolutely, there's an increase in there. We've had the discussion about counterterrorism and the preparedness of the Metropolitan Police to, you know, to be able to um, respond and also in terms of tackle um, radicalisation. This is all within, I mean, it really does, you know, you can prioritise and prioritise, but if you haven't got the resources and the capacity to absolutely really prioritise, it is a difficulty. The Met is spread thinly at the moment because of, because of the budget situation we're in, and it is going to get worse. So absolutely, there has to be the right tactics, there has to be the right capacity, but this is in the context of resources diminishing, resources reducing. So those prior, it's prioritisation of a smaller amount of resources, and it is going to have an impact. So we can talk about prioritisation, but actually in terms of capacity going forward, it's with less officers. Yeah, yeah. Fewer, sorry. <laughs> on, on the subject of bikes, I remember as a cabinet member buying off-road bikes for Met Police and the hoops, the bureaucracy and the training that they had to go through, it, it didn't work. I hope you've improved that piece because the bikes in the end ended up sitting in a... Met Garage, which was a great disappointment to us all. Now, we've got the last set of questions on frontline policing, uh, particularly around the Pathfinder projects. Keith, you're leading. Thank you. Um, first question is for Sophie. Um, can you tell me, Sophie, what uh, is going to be the proposed, or what is the proposed um, evaluation process for the BCUs? Pathfinders. We are looking at the evaluation at the moment, and we have uh, it has gone through the governance structures. It is going through the governance structures of the Pathfinders, so it's going back out to the leaders, operational um, operational people as well. 
to look at what the impact of the pathfinders has been. And we've had discussions here around response times. They are back to what they should be. But in terms of the criteria, we are looking at, yes, we are looking at response time, we are looking at safeguarding, and we are looking at what the overall operational effect and you know, impact has been. That's been undertaken at the moment. We hope to be able to publish something before Christmas on that. So, yeah, I was just, that was going to be my next question, actually, on the time scale. So, do you think you'll publish the outcomes just before Christmas? We on, hope to. Yeah, okay, great. And um, can you tell me, what do you think success will look like? So, in terms of what, when we set down this path of, um, when we set up the pathfinders, we did set out that criteria that I've talked about around operational impact, what, it's, what impact it's had on safeguarding, partnership work. Success will look, which should look like that it has not had, you know, the response times are holding up. Safeguarding, there should be some positive signs around that. And that also in terms of the, the um, journey of the victim and the journey of the, in terms of partnership work, that that has been, you can see early signs of success. It is early stages. It has, you know, as you know, it started in January, wasn't fully in place to the end of March. It's early days. But that evaluation is looking at that and is, being, um, is going back out to the partnership to make sure that it is in line with their, their experience as well. Will you also be consulting with the Assembly members involved too? I'll be very happy and I've said before that we will, um, I'm always happy to meet <coughs> Assembly members and we will, um, I've already had discussions um, around making sure that we come back and set up a meeting to have a briefing meeting around that evaluation. That's, that's helpful, thank you. Um, so if uh, when you report in December, it's deemed to have been, using the words loosely, a success or it works, because I understand you know, the motivation behind doing it. And I have to say that in some instances, merging, say, the uh, investigation teams and so on has been uh, beneficial. So, so if we see that in December that um, it looks as though it works, the system works, it's merging of boroughs, uh, do you, what, what is the next step? Will the decision be made to go ahead and create, the, I believe it's the 12 um, merged borough units or will there be some kind of phased rollout? What, what's, what's next? So subject to the evaluation and um, formal decision making, uh, the next phase will be to uh, set up two more basic command units in two other areas of London. When it's not a question of rolling out to the whole of London. This takes significant amount of work, significant amount of change, and it needs to be, it needs to be phased, so that will be the next stage. That'll be a phased rollout. Okay. Um, and when, so if we assume that it, December says it's okay, your partners come back and they will go, yeah, you know, we, we get it, it works, or we can live with it. Um, when do you think that rollout would start? So, in, we have had discussions with the leaders of councils around this, and, you know, the direction of travel, I mean, the early signs are very positive. There, are, there is some work being undertaken at the moment to uh, prepare for the next phase, uh, because it does take a long time, and that's one of the... One of the learnings from the pathfinders, it mm. takes a long time to set up the internal sure. mechanisms sure. and in terms of the preparatory work. So that preparatory work is being undertaken, has started <coughs> in two areas in London and those discussions are happening. But the formal decision hasn't been taken, will be taken sometime in December and then that phase will start, you know, start, um, that phase will really gather pace. I think we'll probably be mid next year, I'll turn to Martin, sort of yeah. mid next year by the time it is up and running. <coughs> But from what you're saying, um, it would seem that you're, you've already identified, I won't ask you, but you've already identified the two areas where you're going to go to next. The Metropolitan Police have identified the two areas where they'll go to, yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and can I just ask you finally, um, in relation to the rollout, what if you were to come across extreme opposition from the leaders stroke mayors, depending on which executive, executive position it is, uh, how would you deal with that or would you just leave them till last? In extreme opposition to, in what sense? In imposing uh, a tri-borough, I'll use that, <coughs> merged borough command unit. 
So we know, because we, and myself and Martin did go around every borough at the beginning of this year to talk to them about setting local priorities, but also about setting, you know, what the, the proposals were around changing the structure around basic command units. We, as you know and I know, nobody wants change. Nobody really thinks, exactly. everybody would prefer it to stay as it is. The fact is that it is, no change is not really an option. The question is, how is that change implemented? <coughs> how do we learn the lessons? And how do we make sure that, it, you know, what was a bumpy ride in the uh, Pathfinders is not a bumpy ride next time round? And that every time that it does, you know, we do look at the, the way that it's been restructured, we make sure that it's right and proper for that area. So in terms of, do, is everybody pleased and happy that this is happening? No, no, they are not. But we have, one, we have to improve the service to vulnerable people. And that, we never mustn't lose sight of that in terms of this. That actually, that safeguarding element is incredibly important. And two, we do need to make sure that we're getting the savings and the, the, the money out of the system so that we can protect the front line. I'm not unsupportive. Um, so again, from what you're saying is, uh, what you're saying, this will happen now. Assuming, assuming that in December all the boxes are ticked, or as many ticked boxes as possible, you're, after December you'll roll out another two mid next year, but the intention is absolutely to make this work across the whole of London? Subject to the formal evaluation and the decision making that needs to take place, we expect that actually in terms of the evaluation, <coughs> given, given what we know has happened and what the positive signs are around safeguarding, we expect that it will have, you know, we've got to take the formal decision, have the formal evaluation, but there are two other areas in London where we are preparing for the next phase. Right. Could you just elucidate on the decision making process, what you mean by that? Well, as you all know, Keith, from your time in MOPAT, there are various decision-making processes around the, um, the finances that have to take place. They, this will take some, some money behind, you know, some finances, and there are the decision, budget decisions that need to be taken around it. And who's making those decisions? Well, I, as you know, the Deputy Mayor has the, um, through the, well, through the Investment, Investment Advisory Board, takes the formal decisions around that, and they are formal decisions that are always put on the website. These are the financial budget decisions that need to take place. Thank you. Yes, thanks. I wanted to ask some questions about the evaluation. Um, first of all, um, Camden and Islington one, which is obviously what I'm primarily interested in. Uh, the Camden Safe and Neighbourhood Board has been told on a number of occasions that it will be part of the yeah. review, but they've yet to hear how or when they're going to be involved. And as December is only two weeks away, um, how and when are they going to be involved in that process? So they should have heard because there is an absolute commitment well, well, to... Well, they haven't, because yeah, I no, read I, only a couple I, of days ago. I told you, I'm not suggesting you're not telling... You know, I'm not suggesting that that's not the case. They should have heard. We are putting... The, you know, the, there's been discussions around ensuring that, not just in Camden and Islington, but in the Pathfinder and the East as well, that the yeah. Safe Neighbourhood Boards are part of this and that it will, the, it will happen soon. But, we don't, but you can't tell me when. Well, I thought it had happened, so... I'll chase well, it hasn't the answer to that. So. Okay. Um, next question um, is about the criteria. Now, at the September's MQT, I raised this with the mayor, and he promised to let me have the objective criteria against which it's going to be assessed. And then we had a letter from the mayor, I had to remind him at the next MQT, to Jeanette Arnold on behalf of the whole of the Assembly, um, 13th of October. And reading it, the criteria are very subjective. They're not objective criteria at all. So are there any objective criteria against which it's going to be measured? For example, specific criteria, emergency response performance being at an acceptable level. How do we define an acceptable level? Is it as good as it was before the merger? Is it not as good as it was before the merger? If so, or is it better than it was before the merger? Are there numbers mm -hmm. to which we could attach uh, uh, a, an objective evaluation of that particular one? Uh, borough priorities, the ability to deliver the locally agreed borough priorities. Well, that's Again, rather a general subjective view. And safeguarding, again, detection rates at an acceptable level. What is an acceptable level? Are the numbers attached to this? Or is it, in fact, a subjective assessment uh, which is designed to make sure they succeed as far as the evaluation <coughs> is concerned? I think that's probably a question for Martin, actually. It's a new call, isn't it? Well, I think all of those things are measurable. I don't, I'm not, I don't know, I haven't seen that letter, but I'm all surprised. of the, where we are looking is we are looking at where the boroughs were in performance terms prior mm -hmm. to them becoming 
right. of ECU. We need to accept, I think, that during that transition period, there's always going to be a bit of destabilised, or it's going to be slightly destabilised. We then get to a point where we can look and see whether, the, objectively, on the figures that we would measure in terms of crime performance, in terms of call response performance, and a range of others less quantitative but equally important qualitative elements around particularly how partners feel we're performing in terms of the safeguarding <coughs> arena and some of the metrics around um, the um, neighbourhood officers and abstractions, etc., which we get pushed on. All of those things we will be able to measure and compare to where we were prior to right. the amalgamation. Okay. So can I assume from what you've said, Martin, that the assessment will be on the basis that nothing is going to be worse than it was before the merger in terms of emergency response times, detection rates, and so on? Well, that would certainly be our objective, yes. So that's your objective. So if yeah. it is worse, then that's cons not considered a success. Well, then we need to look and understand why that is, if that, if that was the case. I think what, I mean, in terms of, there's nothing subjective about response times, and in terms of the response times that I look at from the pathfinders, we look at the pathfinder themselves' response time and then the MPS average, as well as the target that the MEP set down for themselves. So that's the, the, you know, those are the very objective figures that we will be looking at in terms of evaluation. And we've got the figures for, in terms of the pathfinders now and the MPS average for October. So. Yeah, well, I mean, I've got the figures here from an MQT answered on, well, on, just answered actually. And, and it shows that certainly um, the I and S calls uh, for the Central North BCU are a lot worse than they were before. I, I mean, I haven't got these go up to September, so if there's been a magical transformation in October and November, that, that would be there great. There has been a significant transformation. Uh, and I'm pleased to hear November. it, but certainly they were significantly worse. Uh, and the other thing that the, the other sorry, thing the I calls for Central North are better in September 16, they were 86%, and in October 17, they were 87%. Well, so September sure. 2017 uh, <laughs> is 82%, yeah, 82%, yeah. and yeah. in October 2016 it was 89%. So, so it's fluctuated. I mean, yeah. So there we are. Can I, can I um, just make one that other? That doesn't sound better to me. Can I, the, the, the other point I was going to ask, the other point I was going to, well, fine. The other point I was going to ask, the letter from the Mayor quite rightly says this is all in the context of, of finance of the Met, and we all understand the pressures you're under. Um, and I asked the Mayor, and I've just had this question answered, how much do you expect to save in a year as a result of the Camden and Islington borough merger? And also, second question, how much do you expect to save a year if the rollout takes place across London? The answer was, no figure can be put on the savings. Now, if this is about saving money, before this exercise was embarked on, surely there must have been a projection about how much you expected to save from the process so we can then judge objectively whether the game's worth a candle or not. Because if the amount of saving isn't very much and the disruption it's caused is huge and the performance isn't quite what it should be, then maybe the game isn't worth the candle in the first place. And I, mean, it's not, I think it's pretty clear that most of these mergers are not popular, certainly in Barnet and, and, Barnet, uh, Haring, uh, and, 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 uh, and Harrow, that it's not very, uh, not very keen on the merger with Brent, uh, which seems, from what my discussions with senior officers, is happening anyway. But putting that together, surely there must have been some financial assessment of the benefit cost benefit analysis of this and to be told no figure can be put on the savings sounds really serious to me in relation to we've just had discussion with keith around where you know where will decisions be taken i expect to see a business case in december which will set out the figures for the savings in terms of what that looks like because the pathfinders have had to change and there has been learnings you know some of the learnings from the pathfinders that model has changed that is still being worked on as to if you were to implement the type of model the pathfinders are now now working under what are the savings i expect to see that in the business case and we should have that figure by december there are savings to be had because you're not doing the same thing in same thing 32 times in 32 different areas but it is yes it is about savings as i've always said but it is also about service improvement around vulnerability safeguarding adult safeguarding and children's safeguarding and we mustn't lose sight of that exactly that's the whole point of of, of my questions it's how we can objectively assess whether that in fact yeah. has been achieved mm -hmm. yeah. or whether it's so, just hang on let me finish the question well, that's been objectively achieved now you're going to be doing all these various assessments in december um, are we going to have, me in and Keith in particular as well, because we're an, an, an unmesh, a, a publication of 
the evaluation yeah. with the hard numbers in it in terms of savings, projected savings, uh, the uh, tenants times, all the other things I've talked about, will that be published so we on the Assembly can objectively assess whether in fact we consider it to be a success, even if, even if, assuming you do? Not only will it be published, but as I've, I think I have offered today and I've offered previously, we will, you know, myself and the Met, um, either Ed Martin or Mark Simmons, will come and brief you on it so you can, you know, you'll have the publication and that there'll be a discussion around it. I'm very happy to do that. And it's, you know, in terms of, it isn't just about response times, it is about the safeguarding and there are various ways that you can look at that yeah. around sexual assault, detection rates, around child cru cruelty, around, also around, you know, um, in terms of timeliness of the, um, of the meetings that take place around child protection. But there's also Ofsted who have go in and inspect children's services. And the, there are positive signs coming out of Ofsted. We will also be talking to HMIC about, you know, moving on from the path, moving further forward on the pathfinders, what their view is as well. Well, thanks for that. I mean, I think the concern all along has been this is going to be some sort of subjective fix. And if we're going to have a proper objective analysis, then I think we all want to see the numbers yeah, to prove yes. that it works. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, okay. and can, I, can I just make a couple of comments on that? I mean, uh, the numbers will be there, but equally you could describe it as subjective, but in, those, in all the five boroughs that are currently part of the two pathfinder sites, the view of the directors of children's services and those others that we're working directly with, I think, are important. Just a couple of other points around the saving. The other way through the lens of looking at part of the, the savings drive for this is, by April next year, we will have 30,000 police officers from the number that we were at. And there, we, professionally, will not be able to deliver the service. That's why we embarked on the process 32 times over to do all the things that we've spent the, the last couple of hours talking about. This allows us, in a, you know, from our professional perspective, allows us to deliver that service more effectively by having that critical mass. And it allows us to deliver on, we've, we often skate over now the neighbourhood offer and the, 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 that is part of this and we kind of skate over that because that's very popular but this allows us to deliver that. It allows us to make the savings in terms of bringing together CID offices. It has a potentially massive impact around safeguarding but of course, and what we've all focused on is the, where, we went, where it went down in the response times. But the last thing I would say about that is we mustn't just look at the... BCUs in isolation compared to what they were previously. I think that has to be seen in the broader context of London because the kind of pressures that the BCUs have seen at the same time of doing all the change under their business as normal or business as usual is what other boroughs have seen as well. Mm. You particularly go to the boroughs up in East London, they have all been under enormous pressure in terms of response, in terms of delivery, you know, Newham is a classic, you know, the pressure Newham. So then we must look at them in the context of the Met, because as we've said before, significant increase in um, requests for assistance, the crime challenges, the terrorism challenges, da -da, all of those things are, we can't just pull out two boroughs and say, what, what do they look like compared to what they look like? We've, I think we have got to contextualise we, it. We don't, we, we're not saying we want this thing to fail. No, no, I'm not saying happen. you are. Not what, saying what we're saying is we want to be satisfied objectively that's, that's that it works. Reasonable. And we understand the pressures that you're under. Of course we do. Um, we've talked about it often enough in this committee. Yeah, exactly. the, the other thing I'd just like to be assured is included in the evaluation is what the community, through the Safe Neighbourhood Boards and yeah. the, and the councils, yeah, are, are, yeah. are saying is included in the, in the published evaluation. Definitely. Thank you. Well, there'll be a couple of people in there we need to move on. I think it's a, the narrative about improved services is going to be so important. I mean, my th three boroughs where I am, none of them want to work with each other at all, politically from the top to bottom. So you need to be able to go along with the narrative saying, you will have a better service um, across it if we do these changes. Anyway, I saw Keith and then Leonie, yeah, I think, then we move on. Just a quick one. In relation to um, your kind offer of a meeting, Sophie, um, as you probably know, trying to get a meeting with uh, deputy mayors and uh, assembly members is, is easier to herd cats. Um, do you think we could start the process of trawling for some dates now rather than wait until you've got the report? Absolutely, very happy yeah. to. You'll have a rough idea when you're going to get the report, won't you? Yeah? Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Um, given all the problems and issues that have arisen from the two trials, the one being a two-borough trial and the other being a three-borough trial, is it really sensible to continue to look at a four-borough 
uh, merged BCU in, in my area and looking at Merton and Wandsworth also with Kingston and Richmond. And I'm sure this is a question that will be of interest to um, Tony Oliver as I well. Am listening, yes. I, I mean, is that really sensible? I mean, there's been huge delays that are now resulting from these trials. Is it really sensible to go ahead with even looking at the four? Uh, I think it is because we worked up the model of where we think the, the, the mergers should be to give us the best chance of delivering policing service in each of those areas. One of the real challenges in the southwest corner is that three of those four boroughs are very small in terms of police officer numbers as it currently stands, and that's back to that point that I was making about having that critical mass to deal with everything. We have learnt an enormous amount in the two Pathfinder sites, and I think at the outset there was a real level of cynicism that this was just a you know this is just a done deal and, and run it through we've changed what we proposed we were going to do in both places quite dramatically in the east less dramatically in in the center and we've learned an enormous number of lessons which i think will mean that the the kind of disruption if you like as we move forward if we move forward it will be much less we are we have um identified who we want to lead in those circumstances so that we are starting conversations and having discussions much earlier but one of the key principles that has come out of the two pathfinder sites for me is that this is not a one-size-fits-all model you have to adapt the model to the particular circumstances of whichever boroughs and however many boroughs are brought together under the bcu and collectively us at the center but particularly the bcu commander that individual will have to work how we best deliver policing services across that geographic area. So I entirely understand the concern, and I think there's no doubt that there's been, it's been more challenging to pull the three together in the east than it was the two in the centre. I think there are a range of issues that contribute to that. But we've learnt an enormous amount in the last nine, ten months, and we will feed that learning into as we try and take this forward. Well, it's good to, just to follow up on that, it's good to hear that you're starting those discussions now because I think you can't start discussions about a big process of change too early. Precisely. And particularly where you're looking at four coming together because you'll have, you know, the thing with the three or the two, you know, you've already got those different cultures between two um, separate units or three. When you've got four, you're going to have four separate cultures. And Steve just referred to, you know, the, 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 the spread across the south, south, south central, southeast. Uh, and people yep. not being keen on that there. So I think that's really critical. I think what I'm slightly concerned by you talking about three smaller boroughs and reaching critical mass, and whether that might then have an impact on the other um, inner London borough, and whether police are going to be taken away from clearly looking at the statistics. Yep. There is more crime in, in Wandsworth yep. than there is in the other three boroughs. I, I think there'd be huge concern um, if that meant that to achieve critical mass or to uh, increase officer numbers in the other boroughs, the officers were going to all be moving from Wandsworth to somewhere else. Can you yeah. assure me that that is not going to happen? See it the other way, actually. <laughs> well, I mean, you may want to ask the reverse question, but that's the one I'm asking. Thank you. I'll answer both questions in advance, yes. if I can anticipate your question. Um, <laughs> the, um, the fact of the matter is... The, I, I wouldn't the, do that, it's ill-advised. The point I was making about the critical mass was... With all the things that we need to do, there are a number of boroughs around London, not exclusively those three in the southwest, where just simply the number of officers that we start with don't allow us to deliver everything we need to do. And there are already some elements of the service that people have joined together. They've joined together to make it work. Once you are into a new defined unit, the challenge then is you use your resource as best you can to deliver all the services that you need to deliver. Everywhere in London, there are, it is, there are places that are busier than places that are, and places that are less busy. And we need to use our resource intelligently to be in those places where there is demand. And you manage demand in different ways, but that's, you would expect that's what we have to do. So I don't see this in, in means a big shift either out of Wandsworth to, to find more people in, in the other three boroughs, or conversely, which I suspect would be the concern in the smaller boroughs, which is we're going to lose our people because they'll all be going into Wandsworth because that's where the work is going to be. I think we are capable of being more intelligent about how we use those resources and how we link that into the preventive work we're doing. There are some things you will do once across the borough or across the BCU because it makes sense. There are other things where you very clearly need 
a very local footprint and you're working locally. So, but the point I think is what will work and fit in that part of London will be different to what will work and fit in another place where two boroughs are coming together. And we've got to have those conversations and work with both local uh, leadership, work with our, our, our leaders, work with other local leaders, work with communities to work out the way that you do that. But I do come back to the point that we aren't able to maintain the model that we currently run because the resource level doesn't allow us to do that. We need to provide the right service and I think there are opportunities here, but we've got to talk and work our way through them. Well, I'm, I'm reassured to hear that there is going to be that nuanced um, approach that will be made to fit in each area. But I think maintaining that ongoing dialogue as um, the change starts to be discussed is really important I to ensure entirely. that we don't have those cultural differences that just grow up from people no. working in one or two, and in, in the South West case, four different teams. As you bring those teams together, it's really important. I mean, as you know from what I said earlier on, you know, we know that the police will always step up and will always be flexible, but it's making sure that we take people with us um, as we do that, and that, you know, in this current very difficult context, um, that a process of change also being thrown in as well. It's hard. That's it? tough. It is tough. That's really tough. It is. Thank you. Thank you. Last question, Caroline. Yes, I want to um, pick up um, with you, Deputy Mayor, about the public access strategy. So this is your plan to close um, police front counters and police stations across London and selling off a huge amount of the estate. Do you want to give us just an overview of, of how the strategy now stands and what steps you're taking next? So we, as I'm sure you're aware, we published the final public access strategy at the beginning of the month, which um, was in response to the consultation process that we undertook. Um, we will be closing 38 police front counters across London. These are closures and decisions that we didn't want to, I'm just repeating what I know you know, the decisions that we did not want to have to take, but we are having to take because of the budget situation we are in. We have to get money out of the system, and this is part of the process of finding those savings and efficiencies in order to do so. The decisions that have been taken uh, will save about £8 million a year in terms of revenue costs, which is the equivalent of, a, of, of about 140 police constables. Um, and so we are trying to protect the front line as much as possible. But I have always, always been clear during the consultation as well that this is protecting the front line, but it does not mean that we are out of the woods because we still need to find nearly 200, I think about 200 million pounds worth of savings. So we are still going to be in significant difficulties around police officer numbers. And you know, the mayor's been warning around, and I have warned as well that we will dip below 30,000. And if we carry on without any significant in, um, investment, we'll dip, we could get to 27,500. Rehearse those, so and I understand In terms that. of the so, changes from the yeah. consultation, uh, we took the decision to retain the 24 hour uh, front counter at Dagenham, um, retain the, the front counter at Bexley Heath, at Kensington and Chelsea, we do intend to dispose to, we will close the Notting Hill Police Station <coughs> and sell it, but we will, uh, we want to introduce, we recognise the needs of the community around Grenfell that was raised with us during the um, consultation, and we are discussing with them at the moment where we should put a temporary uh, front counter nearer, the, nearer to Grenfell to, to um, you know, as part of, as part of that. And in Hillingdon, we, um, whilst we are making the swap from um, Uxbridge to Hayes, uh, we will retain Ryslip Police Station for operational reasons. But we will be, there won't be the, the um, proposals that there will be no um, no public access there. We did also look as part of the um, part of the consultation around those areas of London that actually in terms of travel times it's over 60 minutes um, and there are now seven areas of London where that is the case and as part of the response to the consultation there is a commitment to ensure that there are more community contact sessions in those areas. There is it's a small, I think it's about 3% of the population of London, it's about seven communities that are in that situation. Okay, so um, and can you just confirm to so the Bexley and Barking examples you gave is that they're permanently off the table, or is that something you may revisit in time? No, that's Barking and Dagenham um, Police Station and Bexley. That is a decision to retain the 24-hour front counter. OK. There. And these additional community <coughs> contact sessions you're trialling for six months. Will there be a proper objective review of, of how they've worked? Well, we will, we will trial it. And, I mean, in terms of uh, looking at... We, we did say in the um, document that we would review it, because if they... I mean, if they're not used... Mm. 
we will communicate it if they're not used. It's, it's, we, you know, we, I believed that it was an issue. If they're not used, it's less of an issue, and we'll have to take a decision about their future. Now, the original um, strategy uh, that you consulted on had a huge engagement element as well. This you seem to have t stripped yeah. out from the public access. Well, why have you done this, and what further work are you going to be doing on engagement? So we uh, did um, divide it out, and the, uh, the document that we published at the beginning of November was only on public access. We will be doing more work around public engagement. We felt that there needed to be more work around that, that we were get, having a lot of conversations around front counters rather than conversations around engagement. We, we're going to be putting, putting together some more work around putting together an engagement strategy. It's incredibly important in terms of trust and confidence in the police. We wanted more time to do that. So on reflection, was it a mistake coupling the two together in the consultation? I, I don't think it was a mistake. I think it's, um, it's, it's, you know, we put them together because this is, it is about how you contact the poli your police and how you engage with um, your police officers, but during the course of the consultation um, and in, in taking the decisions, we felt it was better to decouple it. Mm. Now, um, you have been um, uh, given the wonderful... Um, award of carrying out what's seen as the worst consultation of 2017 by the Consultation Institute. Um, very, very critical of the initial document and then your, um, your uh, response that came out um, 15 working days after the close of the consultation. Concerned about vague statements such as we heard concerns that it is clear the public want without any evidence backing up the leading questions I've addressed with you before. Um, really very damning saying it was poor from start to finish. What are you going to do given this criticism, not just from us as a committee and certainly I've raised it with you, what are you going to do to review your consultation <coughs> mechanisms to make sure that you are best practice rather than being seen as the worst? So I've seen those criticisms and um, the Institute has been in contact with me and I will be meeting them to discuss those criticisms. But I, you know, I've seen them, but in terms of the engagement and the consultation process, we had over 4,000 replies. We had, I think, about 1,500 people come to the consultation meetings. So in terms of actually public engagement, I think we did a pretty good job in getting that message out to people and discussing what the issues were with people. We had more um, people respond to this consultation than responded to the previous police and crime plan, which was very much front and centre around police stations, but also about priorities for London. So if you take into consideration that we spoke to, we had the views of over 8,000 people for our police and crime plan, and then those thousands of people that um, participated in the engagement around this consultation, we did get the message across and we did engage with people. But clearly, as I know the Mayor and myself have said to you before, there's always lessons to be learned very willing to learn those lessons and to make sure that any other consultation we've learnt lessons and it, as with any organisation you should always be looking to improve. Do you accept that you could do better and we would expect for future ones that you'll be seen as uh, modelling best, best practice? I don't think anyone should ever be complacent, you know, you're never, never perfect so you, yes of course there's always improvements to be made. Thank you. Okay, any more questions on that? Okay, thank you very much. Um, can I thank our guests for attending today and your very, very full answers, which we uh, appreciate. Um, I'm going to ask the committee to note as a background the monthly report from MOPAC, note the report and answers given by the Deputy Mayor for the question from members, item 7. I'm going to ask the committee to note the work programme and delegate authority to me with consultation with scope for reference on child protection, date of next meeting is Thursday the 30th of November at 10 o'clock. I have no other business. Thank you, colleagues. GLA Chamber Sound.